Okay, so for anyone that hasn't seen or possibly even heard of topography before, I left Corda a year ago and I left to make carp fishing films. They're available every single month on the first of the month via the topography website and they are between two and two and a half hours long. Sometimes they're even a little bit longer, but they are never any less than two hours. And this episode is four hours long and it's also free. Normally they're $5.99 per episode, but this one, like I say, is free for you guys to watch. And the reason I've made it four hours is to give you a proper insight into what you can expect from a topography film. They're always changing. There is a certain format, you know, certain films that are reoccurring. We change the angler, we change the venue, but we keep the style the same. But there's also another massive variety of stuff that backs these bigger films up. Little snippets, cooking sections, reviews, all of which you will witness within the next four hours. This is far from the best bits, but these are some favourites of mine, and hopefully you're really going to enjoy them. So sit back, relax, and welcome to Sopography. Daryl, you recently had a somewhat monumental life change in becoming the father of twins. Tell us about how that's changed things for you. Well, hopefully it's not um, changed things forever. You know, obviously I know things are going to be different, but at the same time, I still want to carry on doing what I'm doing, but um, as luck would have it, you know, we conceived at a time and gave birth in the autumn, not the end of the autumn. So really, I don't feel like I've missed too much um, on, the, on the selfish point of things. But um, yeah, obviously it's to have, you know, we're, we're trying for a child and then to have two. And then you realise that really, really, I'm going to have to be hands on here. And uh, yeah, they're, they're 12 weeks old now and I'm starting to get, they're starting to, to give a bit back, you know, they're starting to smile and it's all starting to, you get the, the, the warm feelings. Obviously I was really pleased to start with, but um, you know, it, you think that it's a switch that as soon as you have a child that you, you're immediately going to be, it's your, it's your world, but it, it's a, it's a, it burns, you know, it slowly becomes more and more and more. And uh, yeah, see, it's good. And how is that, because I'm, I guess casting your mind back, to when you were at your most obsessive, you were probably the most focused guy around, and now you can't be. How does that feel? Well, I think over time that, I, that my fishing's gone that way. You know, when I, before I had Natalie and I've been married and stuff in the early days, you know, when I worked five days a week, I used to fish every single night after work. And then I worked in the print for a short while, and then I'd fish four nights every single week and I would take my holiday every single one of my five weeks I would use for fishing. Whereas now, I'm, because I'm, I've got sort of a bit more freedom, I pick and choose when I go and I don't have to be so absolutely relentless, you know. Um, yeah, I've, I suppose I've got a better balance now. My life, is, my life isn't 100% fishing. My life doesn't centre around it every single day of the week. There's, a, there's a, a more of a healthy balance, I imagine. Do you think... Um you're a, a, you have to be a selfish person to some degree to follow the sort of big carp career that you've had. Yeah, oh, no, no doubt about it. You know, like a lot of people out there probably watching this will imagine think that you know it's talent that catches big carp a lot of the time, or on this or that, on, on whatever else. But it always, I think, boils down to how much do you want something in anything you do, whether it be fishing, sports, or work. If you really, really, really want something then you apply yourself to it fully. And the more you apply yourself, the more chance you have of reaching that goal. And in, in the early days, you know, I used to fish as much as I could every single time, you know, whereas now I focus at the right times and go hard, you know, like people say, oh, how do you go to Orient for five weeks? You know, and, and stuff like that. I, I prepare myself for a long stint and I, cause to fish really, really, really intensely, not just go, but to fish and look and work hard at it, you have to, um, you have to want it, and you can't do that all of the time. You know, it have to, there has to be a balance. And, and if you want something, look, going back to the original question, sorry, but selfishly enough, then you will do whatever it takes to achieve that goal. And yeah, I imagine the early days I was doing sort of 150 nights a year. I don't imagine I fish that much now, but I fish in more condensed blocks. Just to develop the idea of these longer sessions, specifically Orient, I know that at times that can't have been enjoyable for you. But how do you rationalise the, the fact that you're not enjoying yourself at times during these, these trips? Well, anything, anything that you, you want, you know, that's, sorry, anything worth having is generally hard to achieve. 
and obviously you know if you go to the gym and you want to see results from it then you don't obviously always enjoy the pain that goes through it but the pain is the journey and obviously a lot of people go fishing to say they've been and, and they live the fantasy of actually achieving a, a big goal whereas I don't live the fantasy I'm I'm setting out to achieve the goal and I understand that the, the roughness and the, the suffering comes with it. And I look back on those, those five weeks that I'd done at Orient and I blanked for a month and I think I didn't do anything good. You know, I didn't fish well. I fished like a complete and utter noddy. But I, the whole time I just kept the belief that at any one moment I will realise or see the piece of information that will change this. And yeah, I just, I, I, I guess that I'm, probably a little bit more mentally tough than some people to be able to to go through the the things that aren't quite as pleasurable you know sitting in the mud to not catching the being on your own um a lot of people will think i've had enough of this jack this i'm going home and i had those thoughts but i've yeah i've suffered many long blanks on various campaigns over the years and yeah i wasn't prepared to leave without without finishing i want to dig a bit deeper and and ask you about what it is in your upbringing that, that makes you a success now? What do you think um, contributed to that mindset that's made you a great angler? I think, you know, you hear obviously like, it's, really, it's really not the same, but like in that way, you hear people say, oh, I've come from the bottom, you know, we didn't have a lot. I lived on a, in a rough background. I didn't live in a rough area or anything, but I was, we wasn't, we didn't have money as such. And, if you haven't got money, you have to find ways to to amuse yourself and, and do things that don't cost a lot of money and be sort of passionate about what you are doing. And um, when, obviously, I left school, worked in the tackle shop, and I worked five days a week, I'd probably earn £150 a week. By the time I'd given my mum £50, I had £100 a week. And you can't do a lot with that sort of money. And other than I could fish every night, I could buy myself a bag of sausage and chips every night. I was getting a bait relatively cheap. And that was, I was doing something that I really aspired to do without having to um, have a lot of money to do it. And getting away from, um, you know, obviously your friends and that going out, um, buying real nice clothes, and you've got that sort of, those fashion driven people that are always looking to, to be good. Fishing was away from that for me. It's like, you're just there, you're fishing. You've, you, you've got, we had sort of at the quarry, had sort of a communal sort of want, you know, we wanted to catch the fish, but at the same time, it wasn't about looking good doing it. Nowadays, it's different with social media, isn't it? And I imagine that not having a lot and not being spoiled as a child has, has possibly made me more determined. I'm certainly stubborn, there's no doubt about that. I'm very stubborn, and if I want something, then then I'll go for it. But on the flip side of that, I can be lazy. You know, if I don't want something, you know, other people put a lot of effort into other stuff. Whereas I have to really, really want something. And if I do really, really want something, then I have got a stubby, a, stu a stubborn, bloody mind that's about me to achieve it. And obviously we're, we're conducting the interview in, a, in your family home. And on the outside, it would seem that, you know, for, for a guy who came from a, you know, relatively, you know, modest upbringing, you've done, You've made yourself, made a success of yourself. How important is it? Is it a matter of some pride that you've done that? Yeah, to a de to a degree, you know, like off for 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 don't for any stretch of imagination think that I'm well off because I'm not. But at the same time, if you'd have said to me as 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 a 15 year old boy that you will have your own house, you will be earning enough money to to have a family and holidays and stuff, then I'd have been really really happy. So yeah, I think. Yeah, I'm certainly not in the, the top earners or anything like that of my friends and stuff like that. But I have a, a really nice life and I don't work as hard as many other people do in the I do what I love and the fact that that now pays pays for a reasonable life, you know, I'm I'm far from sleeping on the streets and yeah, I'm yeah, I am proud of that. And how um I know something you, you, you perhaps always are conscious of is making sure that you're still relevant and, and you can still um, bring in the, the, the money as an angler as such. How, how much of a burden is that? Um, I don't know, you know, it's obviously in the early years when I, when I was working in the tackle shop and then working in the print and stuff like that, you're getting a little bit of sponsorship money, which 
it's just a bonus. It's not your work, you know, it's not your work at all. You know, it's just a bonus the, the early sort of sponsorship deals. But now, obviously, my entire earnings come from my representing tackle companies and uh, and the work that I do for people like Corder and stuff. So yeah, I'm I'm entire, entirely my my responsibility is not my responsibility. Like my need for money is is entirely from those companies, and there is an added pressure with that. You know, definitely. You know, before, it's definitely something I'd never thought of until that happens. You know, when you work outside of fishing and that pays your bills, and then suddenly fishing is short. There, there, there is definitely a burden there. So in the winter when I might not have gone fishing. Some winters I've fished all year, but other winters I've had winters off. Whereas now I would think twice about having a winter off or, or not fishing at all because I think oh, I've got a cartwheel diary to write. And you know, social media is such a big thing. You know, if you don't post anything for the three months, then you're not relevant. So yeah, that is yeah, it's definitely a concern now that my entire earnings are based. It's not based around what I catch, but they're based around my presence in in the angling industry. I imagine. And actually along those lines, it is a huge achievement what you've done because I, having spoken to Martin Bowler this summer, he, can, he lists one of his biggest achievements in life as having made a living out of angling for 20 years, you know, and, and you're doing the same thing. So it is a big achievement, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, when you speak to like, anglers abroad and I say what I do, they just absolutely can't imagine it, you know. And in the UK, I don't know how many anglers there are that make their living exclusively from fishing, you know. You could... You can argue people that work in the industry then make a little bit of money, like we said. But um, yeah, I've read Terry Hearn's book as a 16-year-old boy or 15-year-old boy working in the tackle shop and the, read about him being on the dole and then finally making it as, a, as an angler and such. And that was, I've, I'm of a generation that were like looked at that and I, I've got no bones about admitting it. I wanted that, you know, I wanted to follow someone like Terry Hearn and, and earn a living from fishing. It hasn't been quite the same, you know. I've I never went on the dole as such. I've always had a job, and I, I've slowly little sponsorship sort of things. I've never approached a tackle company and asked for sponsorship money, and I've never rung a magazine and asked to write for them. But I've always publicised my captures and drawn the interest that way. And I've all the end goal was always, always to to be a paid angler, you know. So yeah, I'm I've reached what I want, you know, as a such. You know, I'm. I've not, I'm not looking beyond this now, thinking, oh, I want to take it to the next level, I want to do this. I'm quite content, you know, I'm 36 years old, I've got a missus, I've got two kids, I've got a house somewhere to live, and I'm earning enough money to, to pay these bills and to do it from what I love. And I think it's, you know, people say they studied at college or they've done this and done that. Those hundreds and hundreds of nights that I've done at the quarry, done at the North Met, and the, the fishing that I've done, in a way, have been were my studying you know they've been my graph that has put me in this position now um i have two things that are related to that in a way you mentioned your influence um by the likes of terry i, I don't think i've met anybody <clears throat> in angling who is perhaps laney aside so unconcerned by the way you look from a fashion point of view with your kit and you're not influenced by the fashion scene in fishing, are you? No, um, it, I, I honestly, when I, obviously it's a massive part of it now and you see it and I can't help but have a little smirk to myself when I see all these guys more concerned about how they look and trying to be carpy and that. And I just think, I want to catch them because I want to catch them, not because I want to look good catching them or I want the, the status that goes with catching them. I want to catch them and my soul, I'm very narrow-minded on, on, on that side of things and the thought of trying to look good doing it is just like so far away from what the fishing I was brought up with. So when I was fishing the quarry as a kid, all these guys, they're all tradesmen turning up at the lake in their jeans, spat having a few beers and trying to catch them. Not the the what what you look like afterwards, yeah, and I can't... I, I do have to smirk to myself and, and, and when I see it, you know, it's, a, it's the scene, I'm part of it. But um, I, I find it so false, you know. I find it in, incredibly, incredibly false that it's not the, the passion. Should, in my opinion, should be about the fish, about the fishing, not how good you look doing it. You know, that's that's it. Um, we had a little think about these questions beforehand, and um, there aren't many people who are thirty-six with 
the kind of CV that you've got in the in the public eye. Certainly, it, it feels a little bit like the generation before you, the likes of Dave Lane, uh, Terry Hearn, Jim Shelley. It feels like it's um, it's skipped a generation, and and you're one of the very few, very very top line big car panglers that, that that your generation produced. Do you think that could be the case? For what's the question today? Really? I'm not sure. What you, obviously, there's you're saying like Terry and Dave and yeah. Jim are the, the generation before. Before, and you, yeah. but your generation doesn't seem to have produced. There's not many thirty-five year olds, thirty-six year olds out there who are in your position. No, um, I, I think obviously I'm at the end of a special generation of fish. You know, um, I, before this interview, I was thinking that something like this might come up, and in the early days, you know, when when they started out. The biggest fish in the country was so there. It's it's that fish. It's that fish. It's that fish. Now there's so many big fish. Everybody's catching big fish, so it becomes diluted, you know. Whereas when there was only one or two big fish here and there, and those the certain guys went and caught them, then obviously the attention is is, is drawn in their, their direction. You know, the, the special fish, in my opinion, aren't. They're, they're not so out on their own like they were. Obviously, the Burfield Common is still there out there on its own and stuff. But um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I just think it's different times. There's so many big fish. You don't stand. You know, it's not as easy to stand out. Uh, maybe that. Maybe that's the, the reason. So actually, probably what what's made you stand out in amongst those anglers is because you started on the big fish scene so young. You actually caught the end of the period that they were in. Yeah, I, I think that what set me on my path is no doubt that capture of uh, the first capture at Yately, obviously my first 40 chunky, at a time for a 21 year old to, to rock up at Yately and catch them, you know, not just go there, go there and catch them. It was all splashed over the papers and suddenly I was almost like a, a boy wonder. And then from there, the fat lady was one of a handful of 50 pounders in the country and then catching two tone. I think that, that sort of period of my career or we call it career, but of my fishing, sort of put me out there on, on uh, like in the mainstream, viewed, and then obviously pe your eye, people, people's eyes are on you from that point, and then you're more, you're, everything you catch is in sync. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the way you fish. Does it annoy you when you repeatedly get asked, as I'm about to do, about this, the simplicity of your approach? Does it annoy me? No, because I think I think I have got a very simple, direct approach to my fishing, and I think other anglers confuse themselves with too too much other stuff, you know. So I actually take it as I don't take it as a compliment, but like I think to myself, if if they're thinking about that and worrying about that, then they just don't get it, you know. So many people, like even like good anglers, look at my presentation and think, oh god, he obviously doesn't know what he's doing. But maybe there's so many other parts of angling that I see completely differently to, to them, you know. And that's I, I I don't worry I don't worry about what people think of of how I look doing something as long as they understand that I work hard hard at what I do and that I have a certain degree of ability. Then then that's fine. It seems to me that your competitiveness, although buried quite deep, is very fierce and. How much of that was born out of fishing shoulder to shoulder with people on the likes of the quarry? Um, obviously, um, maybe a little bit of competitiveness. Um, uh, James Wilsma used to fish there, um, used to own DT, very good angler, James Wilsma, and we were the same age, used to fish together, and I imagine there probably was a little bit of, of competitiveness there as such. But I think since then, obviously, I've gone up, like what, when I've gone on from there to other waters, it was more about if I could compete, not compete, or achieve what other great anglers had, you know, when I went to Yately, it was all like, the, I thought of these guys were so, so, so much better than me, you know, just, I imagined, you only imagine that you're here, and you don't know, you don't know where, what a really good angler is, because you're only young, and then you go there, and you think, you're only guys with fishing rods, and I'm not seeing any magic here, you know, you're not, I'm not seeing, I've already been fishing a long time, and these guys that I thought were so, so, so much better, I'm thinking you aren't that much better, and if you aren't that much better, then obviously I'm all right, and that gives you the confidence to. I wouldn't say it's competitiveness; it's it's com confidence. You know, I, I have belief in in what I do. You know, and I I, I never doubt that. I ne always I doubt 
is that I need the opportunity and if I put the time in, put the effort in, keep looking, then that opportunity will arise and I believe in, in what I can do. If not competitiveness, then perhaps places like the car park made you more ruthless as an angler because you can't, you're going to get trampled over, aren't you, if you're not? Yeah, yeah there's absolutely no doubt that you have to be, a, to a degree, ruthless. You know, you, you can you can pussyfoot around and try and be the nice guy and suck up all the information and then when you go in and swim, it's hard because you heard that information. The best thing, I, I try and go on a different route to that, as in I don't want to be... I don't try to be everybody's friend. I don't try and ring everybody before I go to a lake. I try and, I just, I'm ruthless with, I want that swim, I will get that swim by arriving first. I will get there by getting there early. Um, and I do it my own way. I, I obviously have to be ruthless. And that is, if you want to compete on, a, on the big carp circuit, a busy carp circuit, then you, you can say you don't want to be competitive. Well, you'd be the loser that doesn't catch anything, you know. Do you, do you want to be the guy that caught them at the end of the season, or do you want to be the guy that done 100 nights and just went in the duff corners all the time? And, and, and I ain't been, I ain't going to sit in the duff corners and camp, you know, I might go fishing to catch them. Um, so yeah, you, you have to be ruthless, but it doesn't mean I like it, you know, I, I certainly don't like it, and that's why I do a bit more European fishing than that, you know, I've sort of, I don't like it, but I know you have to do it to compete. Is it a matter of any regret that your English fishing kind of was a victim of the fact that you have to fish busy waters and, and have always had to fish busy waters. Yeah, in the early days, I aspired to catch these fish that everyone else had caught and stuff, and it was like, I want to catch that, I'm looking up to these guys. Whereas, without sounding arrogant, I'm not looking up to anybody now. I don't feel like I, I want to go and do what they've done or, or he's done. I want to do what I want to do. So that's that's what it's about. It's purely that I want to I want to enjoy the fishing while fishing for good fish. You know, it's in the UK we fish for 150 pounder and everyone's trying to catch that one fish and it's all competitive and when it's when that fish has come out the game's over and it's I I don't want to be part of the rat race. It's almost that is a proper rat race competing for the same thing. I want my own slice of pie and I want the quality of the fishing to be more, and I want more of those 50 pounders. You know, people, people always think that a 50 pounder from France is worth less than a 50 pounder from England, just because there's more of them over there. But everything is relative to the, to the water uh, that you're fishing. You know, going to your typical commercial muddy pond in France that's maybe has a load of 50 pounders in it, and then going to a, a, a really big public lake that's lower stock than any lake you've ever fished in the UK and harder than any lake you've fished in the UK. People don't get it, you know, until, until you've been there and seen it with your own eyes, then yeah, I, I just w I want my fishing to be special. I want a little bit of space to operate and I don't want to compete all the time, you know. I don't all, when you're fishing for one thing, you know, and everybody wants it. it just, you can't believe the density of anglers in the UK too abroad. That's the thing when you go on to the, the similar sort of places, the, de the, the, the competing and the shoulder to shoulder night, it's, that is not, fishing is about adventure and doing what you want to do. Yeah, I've, I've done the scene, in, well, I've been in the scene in the UK, I've competed, I've been shoulder to shoulder, but I've also seen the other side of it and, you know, now I, 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 can, I can afford to be pick and choosy, you know, I, yeah, that's what I think. Do you think, um, do you look around, certainly <clears throat> some of the older big fish guys, eventually they lose the X factor, whether that's the drive, <clears throat> whether that's access to waters or whatever it is. Do you imagine a day when your abilities will decline? I think they're already in decline, from in, in, in total honesty, because it's hunger. You know, that is, I honestly think that the, the skill's one thing, you know, and experience. But how much do you want something? When you really, really, really want something, you go the extra mile. You know, and I think that's what separates the best anglers. You know, forget obviously they need an, an element of good hunting skills, good sort of competitive skills, know how to get into the swims and stuff. But it all really boils down to how much you want something. And you know, that's why I haven't done as much in the UK because I'm not hungry enough for. The, I can't get up for you know i don't the thought of going to chase a fish in the uk one fish in a pond doesn't excite me and and that is that is i think 
that's really what it boils down to. How much do you want it? If you want it, you'll go it. You know, people like Dave Lane, he's, he's I don't know how old Dave is now, um, fit, sprightly, you know, he's got that, that knack, you know, really competitive, keeps it on the low though. He's got, he's got his experience, got his ability to hunt fish, his work rate. Um, and yeah, he, he's, he's motivated still to chase one fifty pounder at a time in the UK lake. Whereas I've, if the right ticket or the right fish come up, then that 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 enthusiasm can come back in a, it can surface itself at any time. You know, if the right fish, the right ticket comes up, then suddenly I'm back in that in that zone. But a lot of the time, I'm just sort of I'm on idle. You know, I'm in idle, just plodding along, plodding along. And then, then the opportunity arises, and then, then I move through the gears again, you know. And, you, and then you're fishing hard. You're leaving home. You're doing the extra night. You're putting the extra effort in. You're preparing your bait. You're meticulously loading your gear, knowing what you're doing. And um, yeah, I, I do. Obviously, the longevity of what I do. So being um, a sponsored angler, earning my living from fishing, it isn't based on what I catch. But at a degree, it still has a relevance. You know, if I was to have a year off and not catch anything, then I'm sure suddenly the sponsor would be be worried about it. So yeah, which is a shame because you know your CV, no one can take that away from you. Yeah, but you're only as relevant as what you are. You know, I imagine most of the people, not even half, most of the people watching this haven't got a clue what I've caught. You know, they've seen a cod fish here, but but they're not paying attention. They're not like sitting there chalking off my goals like a, on a, say a footballer's strikers statistics like there they are they're just boom 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 he's done this 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 and this and this with most of the guys seen it oh Darryl, it's Darryl from Corday he's the guy that was in that masterclass shoot or you know they only knew, know a tiny percent of my fishing okay um we're going to talk a little bit about obviously the, the, the role of the modern carp um consultant if you like does encompass uh social media yep Give us a flavour of um, how do you balance that? How much do you enjoy it versus how much is it, because, is, it, is it taking away something from your angling in your life? I think social media is really addictive. You know, like, honestly, I think a lot of the time you waste too much time, we all waste too much time looking at the screen, looking at what other people are doing when we could be improving our own lives by, in those five minutes that you use 20 times a day, you could be doing so much more that's beneficial to you, but I can't help it. I look at it, you know, I'm drawn to it, you know, and it's, for, for a, a consultant like me, it's a great way to get your captures out there, to build an audience, you know, and stuff like that. It's a, it is a good thing, but at the same time, I bet if I did, if, if social media didn't exist when I was fishing, then every year I would catch a lot more fish. I'm sure that there's hundreds of times every year that I'm looking at my phone, that if I wasn't looking at my phone, I would have seen something that might have resulted in a capture. So you, there is negatives to it, but um, the positives to it, you know, the, the trick is to be, have a little bit of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A little bit uh, responsibility with it. Just not, try not to be addicted to it. Um, well, like I'm being honest, you know, most people say, oh, no, I don't really look at my social media, I only look at it a little. But everybody, everybody I look at, whenever they're around them, they're looking at their social media and you, know, you can use it to your benefit, but it's also you're wasting your life looking at what other people are doing when you could be doing stuff for yourself. Um, the venues on which you've had your most success, did you turn up confident or was it the fear of failure that drove you to success? I, th I think the more difficult the venue or the most, when you hear like hear stuff, they hear say that it's rock hard and blah, blah, and the more notorious they are, that really does bring it out in me. I don't know if it brings it out in everybody, you know. For example, if I went to a lake where I was expected to catch them, and I was there, just, you'll catch them there. Then you just turn up, think, oh, I'll just go in that soon, throw a load of bait out and just do what everyone else does. It's, uh, it is the, the more difficult or the more reputation it has for being hard bring definitely brings it out of me I feel you know because I'm I'm lazy by nature and I like to prove people wrong if I can you know and not just prove it wrong but do it for myself to prove myself that I can do it you know and yeah I think I think that is yeah definitely true the the more difficult that it supposedly be then yeah, the more I can get out of bed for it. And that's what, it again, goes back to what I said, if you want it, the, like you only need to want it enough to, to make it happen. What do you feel separates you from the 
thousands of others who want the same album, let's say, but haven't quite managed to put it together? Um, probably just going the extra mile, you know, that's, like you say, you probably have covered it, you know, is in that, how much do you want it, blah, 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 like I said. You know, and that is the difference, you know, a lot of people, they live the fantasy, they dig the fantasy, they buy the gear, they they think they are doing it, you know, but they aren't doing it because they just haven't got that that grit, you know, that I honestly believe that that is my greatest asset, is my bloody mindedness and grit and sheer determination. Even when I'm blanking and suffering, I've always got, I always feel like I'm still got that, I only need that slightest piece of information and then I'm, I'm going again, you know, one bite can change everything. And I always, I've always got that belief in my determination and in my ability that I will just, I will just keep going until it's done. I'm, I'm, ne I'm never beat until it's done. I might have setbacks and it might take longer than I'd hoped, but at the end of the day, I always believe that I'll get, I will get it done. Did you ever plan for this to happen? What? Plan for what? Did you ever plan for a, a life in angling to, that you've had to actually happen? No, obviously I've said that I hoped, you know, you know, I, I aspired to Terry Home making a living from carp fishing. I always wanted to, but I'd never, I never set about it in a way that if, if someone asked me or Ali or, or anyone in Corda how you would go about being, doing what I do, I wouldn't say you need to do what I do because I've gone the really long way about it. My, mine's all been built around captures. And I don't say that again arrogantly, all, everything that's come to me has come to me as a result of where I live, what I've caught. You know, obviously I'm in a good area, like in the, in the Essex area for, for tackle companies, but it's my fishing that has spoke for me, not me. It's not me going out, doing all these talks, writing all these articles because I want to. Everything that I've ever done has been asked of me and my fishing has done the talking. So, yeah, I, I look at it like that. Are there any parts of the job that you don't enjoy these days? Oh yeah, I'm a fisherman, you know. I'm not the the typical guy that wants to be in the, in the commercial industry now, you know. I, I see what you could say wannabes and I can see it in their eyes and how they talk and what they want, you know. They want that more than the fishing, you know. So yeah, I, I, it's, I've actually lost track of what you actually asked me, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> yeah, sorry. What was the question? Sorry, the question was, any bits that, um, that you don't like of the job? Yeah, yeah, I just, yeah, I just, I, I want to catch the fish and the work comes with that. Do you know what I mean? I, 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 we all go to work now, what you do, don't, I've, I absolutely love what I do, but it is still work. We're sat here now in my kitchen filming. Do I want to be doing this or do I want to be fishing, drinking a cup of tea, looking at the lake? I want to be looking at the lake. But this pays the bills, you know, so, yeah. The work is, is the downside, you know, the fishing's the good side, the work is the downside, but it's still, it's not a bad downside, you know, I, 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 still, I still love what I do, but if someone said to me, you know, just go fishing, just put your pictures on social media and we'll pay you, then absolutely, yeah, that'd be amazing, but no one gets paid to do that, you know, you've still got to, you've still got to do something to earn your money and going to work is, is the downside of that. Um, how much... Has home life, married life, life as a dad affected your desire to be fishing all the time? You know, I'd love to say that I've changed, you know, but that is not true. You know, honestly, you know, I still, as I'm lying in bed, you know, I'm feeling about, I'm still thinking about what I'm going to be doing. When are my big sessions coming this year? What am I going to be trying to catch? Um, you know, I, that's just, I don't think that will ever change. I don't think it can. I think that is me. You know, that honestly, I honestly think that without fishing or even take it, I think I'd be, be less, you know, like I, my life wouldn't be as good if I don't, didn't have the thoughts that, or think the way that I think, you know, and uh, I love my home time. I love the fact that I'm now a dad and I'm, I'm going to be providing for them. But at the same time, I've always done what I do purely for me, you know, pure selfish. I want to catch them. And I'm always thinking about that. And yeah, I, I, although I can't be fishing 24 seven, I don't want to be fishing 24 seven because you get worn out, you get burnt out. Um, and it's those breaks, those pauses, those changes in 
in life, there's different things that give you some reality check. You know, you step back and you think, God, like half the time I'm wearing green all the time and I just think like, this is my life. Just don't, never put in gel in my hair, never even looking at myself in the mirror. And then suddenly you come home and you're like, oh God, this is all real, you know? And, and it's all, yeah, it's, you've got to have a, a bit of a balance. You can't be entirely 100% focused all the time. Otherwise you will burn out, I think. Um, where does your inspiration come from? Because it's, it seems to me that over the years, most of the desire has come from inside. You don't look to others to inspire you, do you? I did early on, you know, when I said like reading Terry and Burke and, and looking at the magazines. But I feel that, you know, as of the years and I've caught what I've caught, I'm now looking, I'm not looking to other people. I'm looking, what do I think is good? Not what do other people think is good? You know, there's, there's so many sheep in the game these days that, you know, they see someone who they perceive to be cool and then they're all suddenly wearing the same clothes and, and dressing the same way and just think, that is not what I'm about. You know, I want to, what, what, do I, what, what gives me the biggest buzz in my fishing? And, and that would be like how difficult the, the, the challenge is as such. And then, yeah, I set about it like that. You know, that's how I think. Do you think um, that you have been equally inspirational as Terry was to you? to other people? No, I don't think anybody's as inspiration in carp fishing as, as Terry Hearn. I think, I think it'd be impossible to recreate that, not just because of who he is and how special he is and what he's caught. I think the timing involved, you know, is, is so, so, so unique with Terry and his character is, is, is what he is, you know. It, it's, if you ask any well, a good carp angler who, who they aspire to, all it, no matter who they are, they're all gonna say Terry Hearn. There's something about him. Um, and like I said, I don't set out to be inspirational. Mine is purely selfish want to, I want to do something, I want to catch that. And I think that, that people are inspired by that, you know, and if they are, then all the good, because that's obviously how I get paid to a degree. It's not because I'm the least inspirational guy, it's because I do something that, that people think, God, I'd like to do that. The reality is most people couldn't, do what I do purely because they haven't got the drive or they've got too many other things in their life. That That is facts, you know. You, fishing is about time and about how much you apply yourself to it. And most people in whatever hobby they've got, you know, you could, couldn't say the same to me. I look at a men's muscle magazine and I see the guy on the front page, he's been airbrushed, he's ripped, ripped, he's working out every day, he's eating all the food, but he's genetically blessed as well. As much as I I think, oh yeah, I might do some weights and I might do a bit of that. I'm never gonna get there because I don't want it enough. I don't want it. And that's the difference, you know. I don't want to be training five days a week, like twice a day, but I'm willing to go and sit on the Orient for five weeks and blank for a month and I'm, I'm still, I've got that grit, you know, so, yeah. Um, okay, I think last question, Daryl. Um, should your little boy grow up to be an angler decides he wants to follow in his dad's footsteps if that's even possible what words of advice would you have for him oh, oh i wouldn't push him down that but obviously if, if he wanted to work in the industry like i, I did mention earlier there's no I, I don't think anybody could recreate what i've done and end up in my position i don't think that that I don't think that is possible in any way, shape or form. There's more bigger fish in the country now than ever before. You could fish harder than I did, no doubt, if you, if you, if you had that about you. But I would look at the, what's the end game, you know? If I could film like you good guys could and I could edit and do, do all my own stuff, then um, yeah, there'd be more money in it, you know? If I, was more, if I was more skilled, you know? I've only got one skill and that is I can, I'm all right, okay in front of camera and I can catch carp, you know, and, and I'm not phased by whatever carp fishing challenge it is because I have confidence. But what other skills have I got? I have got, in all honesty, nothing. I can't change a plug, you know. I'm, I'm not the typical man, you know. My dad died when I was young and I wasn't showing all the sort of the man stuff. So, um, yeah, I'm very limited in my in what I can do, but yeah, I'm sure I could teach my son, but I'm not gonna push it on him. He can, he can, I'll take him fishing, no doubt, but there'll be no push for me for him to go down that, that road. So a and &E, I've had a few accidents, um, a couple of brown accidents in the snow with Garfi, 
and a, and a few others. And this A&E actually isn't for me, it is with Garthy himself. We've had a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of interest in accidents, me and Garth. But this one goes back to uh, a while back when we went to Churnpool on a little trip. There was me, Garth and uh, Neil Spooner. I think we were doing a bit of filming over there at the time. And um, I was smashing them both off the next peg. And uh, I'd hooked into this fish one time and um, stupidly, I wasn't wearing a life jacket. I mean, I'd never do it now, but back then I was young and stupid um, and I didn't have a life jacket on and I hopped into the boat and I was, I was sort of gonna hoist myself out to a hooked fish that had gone into one of the snags. Anyway, Garth, um, Garth got very angry and said that he's getting in the boat with me. Um, so he jumped in it to help me out, reeled myself out to this snag and um, we're hopping about on the boat. It's very, very windy and I've sort of hoisted myself out towards this snag and eventually we've got to it and the braid sort of pointing sort of down into the bottom of the snag. And um, Garth said, right, you stay at the back of the boat because you haven't got your life jacket on. Garth did have his on. And uh, anyway, he's decided to, to grab the line and he's sort of pulling himself towards these, they're real dense snags, really, really deep. And um, he's pulling himself down there and he's, I'm saying, is it still on, mate? He's like, yeah, yeah, I can, I can feel it still on. It's really windy and the boat's sort of blowing from side to side. He's telling me off. He's, he's got the ump anyway because I haven't got a life jacket on. He's, he's an angry little bastard, his garth. Anyway, the, the, the old boat's swaying from side to side. He's saying, keep it still, Jimmy, keep it still. And I couldn't. I was really struggling, so I was holding on to the rod as well and the oar. Anyway, garth sort of pulled himself down to this snag and, and he's, he said, yeah, 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 it's still on, mate. And, he, and all of a sudden it's gone, Dish! And Garth's looked at me like, and he's, he's, his face is filling with anger. He's bright red. He's, I'm like, what's wrong, mate? What's, is it gone? It's free my hand right anyway he's got the <coughs> he's got the right ump look back at me i'm thinking he's going to throw me in at this point anyway the hook's gone into his finger and it's a size four conti and if anyone knows they've got big old barbs on them um so at the time anyway garth's tethered to the snag but but the snag's underwater so his thumb is tethered to the snag underwater on the hook length and i'm holding the rod the boat's swaying from side to side and he's like what are we going to do what are we going to do i'm tethered to the snag Anyway, we shouted Neil, who's down the bank, and Neil's come plodding around. He's like, what's wrong? Garth's gone, send her to the snag. Anyway, Neil's got an orange pair of scissors, some guru scissors, lobbed them into the boat, and uh, I didn't really know what to do, because I didn't really want to go near him. His like, face was bright red, fuming. Anyway, I've, <laughs> I've got towards Garth, and I've put my hand under the water, and we've managed to snip him free. Anyway, so he's got this hook link um, hanging out of his finger with a size four Dread and Continental. And uh, we've rowed back to the bank and Garth's done his best to try and remove it. He's put sort of, um, he's bandaged it up and put, put sort of cloths around it to try and stop the blood. And he's trying to pull it out, but the barb's just too thick. And uh, in the end, he's had to go to hospital. And uh, yeah, he wasn't very happy with me. He's, he's a pretty angry man, Garth, but they sorted it out and he was fine. That was the worst accident ever. My favourite capture has to be a fish that I caught in the spring. Um, I first photographed that fish in 2014 for a friend of a friend and when I first saw it I, I was completely and utterly blown away honestly. I, I, I thought it was going to change my fishing as inevitably, it was, it was, ba it was bound to happen and uh, as he, he pulled it out of the sack and he's, and he's unzipped the sack and as he's like uncovered it, the one one side like both both sides are like they're completely different you know like one side's got like five massive apple slice scales on it and the other side it's like they've got like all five of them scales and just like twisted them up in a big knot it's, it's some crate and it's like bright orange you know some people say oh it looks like a koi and that but it's just like electric orange it's the most amazing fish mint condition you know only known of one two two other bites ever it was just for me it was that was my target for 2016. two years later i finally got my uh my chance to have a go i had a couple of mates in and out it was a it's a real real small lake it's probably two acres full of snags the place and uh there's a handful of carp four maybe maybe six carp if you're lucky and um the place is absolutely rife full of tench rife full of tench and basically every time i went there there was it was always it was always going to be half a dozen tench and if you're lucky you might get a chance at the uh at the carp anyway so i've done me done my bit early in the year I never see any signs of a carp. I went back in May and basically I was up all night with God knows how many tench and um, it, it only took a bite and the, the one that I wanted was in the bottom of my net and 
just everything that went into it was, it's not so much the fish, it's certainly not the biggest fish I've ever caught, but it's two and a half miles from the car, you have to cross over styres, you, you either you either set up one side of the river and cross with a boat or you make the walk. And for me, that was, it, it was always better just to make the walk, you know. And um, after the, the two and a half mile hike up the, uh, up the drain to get to this actual lake, it's, it's the most amazing place. I remember the first time I ever went out in there and I went out in the boat and you're actually, there's so many like under, underwater snags and like, they're not just like little twigs that are, like, break with leg core and that, they are like full on trees. It reminds me of like elephant's legs sticking up out the floor and that, you know, when you go out like over them in the boat, you actually worry that like some might be close enough just to like pop the boat, you know, it, it's, it, it's brutal. It's all edge fishing. If you, if you cast even a bare lead out into the pond, that's it, you lose it, you know, it's, it's, it's a hook and hold situation. It is an amazing place and it's right in the middle of the fens as well. Over, like, over one side, over on one of the drains, you've got probably 700 acres of reeds and there's, there's bitterns and marsh harriers and that is, is, is for me, it's why I go carp fishing. Yeah, it's amazing, it really is amazing. Yeah, every, everything that went into the capture, it was, it was my most earned capture, if you like, rather than, certainly not my biggest ever fish, it, was, it, it, it might have even been 30 pound, I'm not sure, but um, it, it was just, it was mind blowing, it really was. And obviously the fact that there's only half a dozen carp in there, it, it made it that much sweeter for me. My words of wisdom would be to never give up. It's if you if you you're having a hard time, I think just persevere with it. And also, the more effort you put in, the more rewards you get out. You know, you can't sort of think, oh well, I ain't catching if you just not putting no effort in, just rocking up and flicking them out. If you, I do a lot of baiting, and I put a lot of effort in to make the rewards sort of worthwhile you know otherwise if you just feel like you just feel like if you you ain't putting that effort in you don't deserve the rewards and I think sort of not giving up is a, ma a main part of it and if you put that effort in you'll definitely get the rewards and you won't you won't have no problems in giving up because you, you'll be seeing watching hearing catching they they'll all be there they'll all follow it but yeah, don't give up and uh, definitely put more effort in. Coming down to Winchill for probably about seven years on and off now. And one of the best things about it is the margin fishing, which is exactly what we're doing today. Um, and that's why I'm talking a bit quiet as well. Yeah, I mean, it offers everything really. There's three lakes on the complex. You've got Willow, Christchurch, Stoneacre. I've fished all three. Uh, started on Christchurch, did a good couple of seasons on here. And, um, you know, I'd always fought her over the Willow when it was busy or just a rest of swim. Times in the day, go over there, do some stalking and what have you. But uh, yeah, I did a couple of seasons on Christchurch, which is where we are today. And uh, yeah, and then eventually went over on the, onto Stoneacres and did a bit over there. I did sort of five years solid, Christchurch, then Stoneacres, and then I disappeared over onto other places. But it's just one of them places you just got to keep coming back to. The stamp of fish is amazing, you know, they're all big, scaly stunners. Um, and I haven't had them all, you know, so it's not like I'm down here dream breaking anyone or anything, it's just nice fishing, real nice family run complex, got loads of friends down here. It's just enjoyable fishing, you can come down and get fish using all manner of approaches, you know, in the edge, on the top, um, and, and, or you're just standard out in the pond sort of fishing. And like I say, I mean, it's Christchurch, which is like I say, where we are fishing today, it's like over 15, 40 pound fish, you know, in eight acres. It's just, it's, there's nowhere else that offers that, you know, so to be able to come here and just turn up, um, always be able to get on the fish, is, it, it, you know, they, they get around the pond all the time, so it's just nice to be able to turn up, get some rods out, and you know, it's like you sat there and you're just like, it could happen now. <laughs> the areas I usually find them in around here is just like the places where no one really walks, you know, it's them sort of places where people just walk straight past with the wheelbarrow, they're almost got a preconception of where they want to head because they've heard 
so-and-so fish has come out of a certain swim or whatever, so they've got this preconception of this head for certain swims, rather than having a look under trees, climbing up trees, having a look for the fish themselves. There's nothing going to tell you where the fish are better than the fish themselves. And so they're the sort of areas I'd always concentrate on, places where no one really looks and fishes. Firstly, you've got to look at the wildlife. They're the things that I always try and overcome. You know, people hate the wildlife, but I love them. I hate swans. We're going to feed them. And the reason I love them is because everyone hates them, you know, so they don't bother fishing in the edge or on the surface. So straight away I'll always look if, it, if there's fish feeding in a little, little marginal spot, I'll look if there's any coots nests near, near about and just see if they're going to cause me a problem. And if they are, I'll get a load of, load of bait right near its nest and just feed them off straight away, you know, get them diving there so they're not going to cause me any problems. And so after I've dealt with the wildlife, thought about that, I've got to look at the best sort of presentation I'm going to use. Um, like today, it was a real clear area, and if I go over in a rig in there with a leg clip and a big leg hanging off it, the, the fish are going to see it, they're going to suss it. When they're in the margin, um, in, in the shallow water, the, they're, all, they're on guard, you know, they're all, they're, they, they know they're being watched, they know they're being fished for, so the, 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 the senses are really heightened and everything's a lot clearer in, in the shallow water. So straight away I knew that I wasn't going to be able to lower a big blatant rig in there with a pop-up on or anything like that. So I was trying to just go for something subtle and a solid bag is always my sort of port of call that I go for. You know, everything's hidden, it's one mouthful, nice little parcel, I don't start piling loads of bait in. Because um, the thing is with the margins, they're usually feeding on naturals. So the worst thing you can do is put something unnatural in, in the area. Yeah, so when I got here this morning, I done a lap and I was, I was checking in between a few trees. I did find fish in a few areas, you know, but straight away I didn't, I didn't just jump straight onto them fish. You know, I logged it and just kept on going because you might come across a better chance or a better fish you know, just around the corner. So I kept going and I had a look and yeah, I did a full lap and, and I found some fish in this swim and they looked the most up for it. It was the best sort of area. The other, the other sort of zone that I found the fish in it looked a bit wary. It was quite close to the to the snags and things in this. I've caught fish out of this, a similar sort of area before and I know that if you have that clutch nice and loose, fishing in the edge from behind the snags, the fish will always bolt out into the pond rather than if you had a tight line, it'd kite around and go into the snag, so yeah. Like baby cool. Looks like baby cool. Looks like what? Baby cool.
Yeah, so uh, we're actually just doing the interview. And uh, that second rod that we put out, we've ripped off. And it's a banger. Absolute banger. It's not the one that I thought it was. But it's a banger. saying in the interview, these are the scaly stunners that they come for, mate. Look at that. Yolk fell out of the net. <laughs> Happy day. Over 30, 30 pound eight. Score again. Yeah, just over 30, 30 pound eight. Happy days. Yeah, I do know this fish. Like I was saying in the interview, that's why I keep returning to windshield time and time again. Absolute banger. Like it's been in the water about an hour. Now, yeah. can we uh, get a back? See if we get another one. Maybe even uh, get ready for the night. Get the barbecue on. <laughs> this is uh, definitely the better side. That diagonal line of scales there. Proper unique. <laughs> Made up with this, mate. Uh, I reckon we need to uh, finish that interview now. <laughs> Let's get back. Yeah, so like I was saying before I got rudely interrupted and got myself all nice and wet. Uh, the reason I keep coming back to Winchill time and time again is because it's full of scaly stunners like the one I just had. And um, like, as long as you go on location, location is real number one. And that's exactly what I did when I got down this morning. I had a good look around, found a few fish feeding in a, in a margin spot just down here. And uh, yeah, put, put a little solid bag in place. and. And, and that's what that's what happened. They weren't uh, expecting it to happen so quick, but it did, and uh, yeah, that's that, that's the result. I don't really think that the margins get fished that much in, in, in busy day ticket wars. They get so overlooked. You know, people just get this this one track sighted that they've got to find these nice little gravel bars, big biting areas, put three rods tight, and put all the bait as tight as you can, which isn't always the wrong way to go. But if there's bites to be had in the edge, especially during the day, I mean, generally out in the pond is through the night and in the morning and if it's going to be a nice sunny day like it is today the fish will come up in the surface or into the edge so uh, yeah I, I, I definitely think that the, the margins get overlooked. As soon as I'd found out where I wanted to be yeah, I'd sort of just left the fish to it you know there's no rush I, I always see people rush when it comes to marginal fishing you know, but that's not the way because if the fish are in there feeding you're not going to walk straight in there and, put a, and pop a rig in anyway you know, you've got to wait till they move off so you can get a rig in 
So yeah, I took my time, got myself in the closest possible swim to it, and uh, yeah, just got, got my rods out. Like I say, no rush, you've got to get it right first time. Yeah, so yeah, no rush. Got a couple of rods out. Um, they were set up, set up on other setups, but I just snipped them straight off. I knew I was going to have two solid bags. I used a sub braid and fluorocarbon leaders, real strong stuff. Yeah, but once you've, your rods have been packed up for a bit, you take on that curvature of the reel. So I always just put, put the rod behind the bank stick and stretch it out just so it sits and it'll go nice with the contours of the weight then. Line weight is massively important, something that I take into account all the time, especially with doing a lot of boat fishing over on Stone Acres and I, I can see how line sits uh, on the bottom. I've also seen fish come across the line and pick it up with their noses and they'll spook straight off from line, so line lay is massively important to me. I always put a couple of putties up the line just to keep that pin down, extra pin down, you know, and, and I knew in this instance it was going to be quite quite finicky trying to get the rig in position between the branches and that so I just had them about a foot or so up the line and then wound the bag right to the tip well to the top putty and then I could just walk it through the bushes rather than trying to swing it out with all the trees and that there it can be a nightmare. As soon as I've got through the branches and that and I was out into the open I could watch the solid bag go down to the bottom just lowered it down sort of stabbed it in let it rest, sort of tilted the bag onto its side so I knew it was going to dissolve and be presented perfectly and then just kept the tip down in the water, almost stabbing it into the gravel just so it's all coming and coating under the gravel. If I'd have just turned up and dropped straight into one of the main swims, open water swims, I could probably guarantee that I wouldn't have had a bite by now. You know, I'd have probably still been wedding up trying to find a spot and maybe getting my rigs tied up and things but there's no way I would have picked the fish up that quick. Time is the most precious thing in life, you can't get it back so you may as well spend your time trying to catch the fish, that's what you're here to do. And just go around trying to force the bites, have a look what the fish are telling you to do. If they're on the surface, get on the surface. If they're in the edge, fish in the edge. If they're out in the pond, fish in the pond. Day tickets these days can be really expensive, you know, so if you're going to spend the money, make the most of your money. Yeah, so like I was saying a minute ago, um, always cap it wise and make yourself a bite. I was on the way to the car, but as I've come down here, uh, I found some fish on the surface. So what I've done is uh, just fed, feeding the birds off now, weaving the fish to it over there. And uh, yeah, I'm going to have a go on the top, see if I can get myself a little bite. What I'm going to do is because the, um, the fish are just swimming around just under the surface, like six inches, and not quite taking the mixes, they're just nosing them. So, what I'm going to do is something that I call sub floating, which is about six inches up the uh, hook link. I'm going to put a, uh, a cork ball, which will act, act as a sub float, and then I'll put a bottom bait on that'll, that'll sit just underneath the cork ball, like this. Um, yeah, I've done it a few times before. Caught plenty of fish doing it, so uh, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, so let's put my uh, cork on here, like so. Bait stop. And that's my little uh, sub fault. You'll see that'll sit on the surface. Got the surface controller up that end. And uh, yeah, I'll just put a bottom bait on there and this will sit underneath the surface about level where the mouths are because the fish are out there and just the backs are just touching the surface so that tells me that their mouths are about six inches under. Got plenty of fish doing it. Um, yeah, it can be deadly in the right circumstances. So I'll just always have the up bait nice and close to the hook. So if anything snatches out, I'm going to see the to the court ball, I'm going to watch my court, my court ball, not my surface controller. I see it bob under, and that's a striking opportunity. Keep the hook nice and tight. And yeah, uh, I mean, I'm sure there'll be plenty of opportunities where you think back now and just think, 
Oh, I could have done that. On this occasion, you know, I've come across many occasions where the fish just quite, aren't quite having it. But uh, yeah, this, this seems to do the trick when in that sort of situation. When you're doing this, you've got to uh, almost draw it in the path of the fish, you know, because you've got no mixers out there, you've got nothing to trap them into a certain zone. So you see the fish swimming around in, in groups. And if you see them sort of coming up, like underneath your line, I'll always draw it back to it's almost put it straight in the faces. So it's something they're just snatching at on the way through. Here's a few fish just over to the left, also, hopefully. So, uh, I'll move in. So you just come right up to it, swallowed right up, and just twitched off. I didn't get any sort of bob on the, on the sub fault at all. I didn't strike at it. Mm. What I've done now is uh, I had to add a couple of fish to snatch single mixes. So I took the sub subfold off and just put a real bright bait on as the singles, hoping to get one snatch at it. But what this is telling me is, you know, it's exactly what I was on about earlier, about knowing when your chance has sort of drifted away. It was only an half a chance anyway, I thought I'd try and capitalise on it. But uh, yeah, it's getting, the sun's starting to drop in the sky now and obviously want to get some, some rigs out in position for the night and morning bite. So that's, that's what I'm going to do now. I'm quite lucky in the fact that I've fished on this lake before, so I know, I know the general areas of where you need to be fishing. But that doesn't, for instance, mean that I just walk into the swim and go right 17 wraps towards that. That, that marker there. I always do a little bit of leading up, so I'd probably clip up at maybe 17 and a half, 18 wraps and have a feel around the area first. Don't, don't just jump straight onto your known wraps, you want to feel what you're fishing over. I generally on this lake, especially this time of year, like, like the silty gravel, straight away I clipped up, found some real blatant gravel, just chucked a little bit to the left, found some silty gravel and that was me done. A couple of weds around, took probably five minutes, but it, it's well worth doing something like that. My favourite approach on this lake, or, or just day tickets in general, is because the thing is, is they're, re they're really pressured fish, you know, so they've seen everything you know, for a number of years, 20, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So you've got to think of like, what, they're, what they're thinking you've got to get, get in their minds almost. You know, anything too blatant just isn't going to work. I'm not saying you won't catch any fish, but there'll be definitely some fish in the area that, that you haven't got a chance of catching because your, your, your end tackle's just too blatant and it's standing out like a sore thumb. I've seen a lot of fish, especially in day tickets, deal with, deal with rigs with white leads on uh, in the edge. This is stuff that I've seen from the trees and I've seen them just toss them out. Yeah, so a real big lead is something that I use. I always fish a balance, balance bait presentation. I use a rig that sort of got the name the noodle rig now. It's just because it's, it's not my rig that I sort of made up or anything. Um, it's, it's a rig that has been used before, but because I use it so much, it's just come, got the name the noodle rig. It's got a real aggressive kicker on it, large shrink tube kicker. And the reason I use that is because these, these fish, have, like I say, I've seen them from the trees just deal with rigs and spit them out. And it's, it's a rig that I've used for a long time and I've actually used it in the edge and I've never seen a fish deal with it. So that gives me massive confidence when I'm using it out in the pond. I've actually seen fish come in and just controlling their suction, you know, leaving all the heavy hole baits on the bottom and just taking the little bits and bobs. So in my mind, I'm, I'm picturing them doing that with my hook bait. So I like to use a nice balanced bait so every, every fish that comes through trying to control that suction, the bait's just going to go up every time. 
I wanted to fish over on a lot of bits and bobs just to keep the fish guessing really, you know, like random shapes and sizes. So I use mixed particle, nothing too crazy, you know, just I like hemp, maples, little bits of crushed tiger. And boil it, I like to crumb up and just chop, chops, bits and bobs really. As the year goes on, the fish start to wise up. Obviously they've been pressured throughout the year, been caught a couple of times. So it's nice to be able to just keep them guessing so they, they can't suss out that hook bait too easily. I like to keep my bait as tight as I can. I don't want them to spend hours on the wrong side of the spot or in, a, in the wrong area, so I like to keep it as tight as I can because like, one spawn off the side of the spot can be an hour feeding in the wrong place. Everything went perfect last night, couldn't really ask for any better. Rigs went out sweet, the bait went nice and tight. Yeah, but it didn't really happen, you know, there was a few fish showing this morning, but not really in, in, in this area, a bit further up the pond. I put it down to really, there's one other person on last night. And the, the really, it fishes best when there's probably five, six people on here at least. You know, they're used to being pressured, so it almost goes, it doesn't go to your advantage that there's not many people on. Um, they'll just go into the swims where people have been, it was bank holiday weekend this weekend, real busy, and they're just clearing up all the free offerings uh, that, that have spread out down the lake. It was overcast this morning, the sun's just started to poke his head out. So we're going to have a walk down this marginal shelf here, climb up a couple of trees, see if we can find any fish mooching down there. Yeah, so I've uh, come for a walk down this margin, got up a couple of trees, actually found a fish feeding on a little spot on the edge down there. Um, come a bit further down, I found a spot here, it looks really cloudy, all the weeds pushed to the side. Um, looks like the fish have probably been on it this morning. One's just actually come around the back of the spot there now. Um, so I reckon it looks good for another couple of solid bags in the edge. Let's see if we can get ourselves a bite. Last hour now, so how it goes. Yeah, the good thing about solid bags in the edge is it's such an overworked method but you, know, you can't get any better. Um, everything's hidden, anything you can do to hide everything is the best way to go. It's, like I say, it's so overworked, people just think solid bags, small fish, I've caught loads of big, wary fish on solid bags. It hasn't got to be anything amazing, you know, you're only underarming it in, it's not got to be cast. Like these corners, and I just stick it over that hook point so it doesn't get caught up on anything. all the air out of the bag so it sinks like a brick. Now just pierce just the end. So when the air is coming out of the bag, it comes out the top, so effectively the wedge this end with the weight. The air's gonna travel up here and come out the bottom, so it's gonna go in like this and then like that and sit like that. Obviously that's a joy of fishing them in the edge as well. If it does sit a bit awkward you can just tweak it, you've got plenty of time just to move it around and get it sitting perfect before the bag dissolves. When I'm going to walk 
for a stalking opportunity, I always just take my cap, my cap and my shades with me. And uh, yeah, just go for a walk, climbing a few trees, walking in a few bushes. When, uh, if, you do, if you do stumble across some fish, get yourself back to the swim, get your stuff ready, make sure you've got everything that you need, prep it all up, get back to the stalking opportunity where the fish are, and you want everything ready to go. As soon as I'm ready to go, I'll climb up the tree, see if the fish are there. If they're not there, then happy days, I'll fly down quick. Get the, get the rod in, but if they are there, you've just got to wait, you've got to be patient and let them move off. If you go walking in there with a rig, then they're, they're going to shoot off and they're not going to come back. Sometimes you can just semi-spook them off sometimes, maybe a couple little bits of pellet, just throw it over the top of them. Yeah, that, that can sometimes move them, but generally I just like to wait. And then as soon as they move off, I'll climb down the tree and get straight in. Just keeping on that line. Make sure I then put his layout. Sort of the line layout. Clutch nice and slack again. So when the rig's in position, it's massively important that you sit on your hands. There's two ways you can do it. You can either be sat on your hands on the bank or sat on your hands up the tree. The last thing you want to do is be up and down the tree, checking the rig, checking the spot, seeing if there's fish there. You've got to get into a position and stay there. When you're up the tree, it does have advantages because you can see what's going on out there. The fish come in and either do the rig or spook off it or they touch your line and your line lay is not right. You've, you've seen that, so you, you, can, you know you've got to readjust the rig. Uh, I quite prefer to stay up the tree, but sometimes being up the tree can cost your fish. If you can't get down quick enough or the fish actually see you up the tree, then it's going to cost your fish. So it's a catch-22 situation. I've been sat on this rod for about an hour now and nothing's happened. I think if it were to stay here, be a good chance of getting a bite. But as it stands, I've got a couple of rods coming down on tuition, so I've got to wind in, get ready for them. Um, I might even bring one of them down here to have a go themselves and see if they can get a bite like I couldn't. But time to wind in. <sighs> Just gonna climb on the tree quick. Just check they're not on the spot. Best thing you can do is wind in off fish. Fish there, mate. Two fish right here. Yeah, so I've got up the tree. There's two fish feeding right on the spot. So I think I'm going to leave it a minute. So there's one literally tail up just off the side of it. Can't be far away from that bag. Could be on for a bite here. Yeah. Can't be far away from that now. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so that's why you always check to see if the fish are on the spot before you wind in. Which we just about to wind in, got up the tree, saw there was two fish. 
on the spot. One was a better one, one was a smaller one. Let's see which one we've got. So I up the tree when the rod went. That was nice. She's nearly beaten now, he says. Come here, these waders. Where are you getting this energy from? Buzzing. How's that for an <laughs> Zero. Old. Plus ten pound. the pressure as well you know because it's just been caught that many times uh, so they know the edges are a lot safer especially on day tickets like this. Four, ten, three days. So I like that for a result. A couple of fish on the spot, so I left them to it and uh, put straight on it. And uh, yeah, this was the prize. Let's get this one back. pound buzzing with that hope you've enjoyed it majorly in a rush now a couple of hours down for tuition so that shit goes get it This review falls directly between your what's new and your use and abuse section, but I'm gonna cram it into the use and abuse based on the fact that I've got a list as long as my arm of anglers that you lot probably all massively respect their opinion from, and they all tell me this jacket's the absolute nuts. I've had it a short while myself, and I, you know, I agree. 
you put it on, you're immediately warm, and I'm sure that's going to keep happening throughout the winter. And that's why I wanted to do this review, you know. It's a tough time of year to be out fishing when it gets really cold, and loads of you have probably either sat on the bank freezing your nuts off, or you sat there thinking, I need to get myself a good jacket sorted for the winter. So this is the FJ6 jacket from Fortis. That's what I'm wearing now in the DPM. It's a very, very good option. It's £139 RRP and you know it's well worth it talk to anyone that wears it i'm sure you've seen people everywhere wearing it it's a very popular jacket and that's testament to how good it actually is so if you're looking for a winter jacket this year then look no further than this and there's a few key features i'm not going to bore you the technical stuff because i don't know it all i know is that it's meant to be really warm and it does just that so key features the tail of the jacket is slightly longer to keep your bum nice and warm. You've got toggles at the side to fasten the jacket, stop the wind getting into it. You've got a strap on the hood, which enables you to pin the hood down. You've got a front chest pocket, an inside chest pocket. And last but not least, you've got thumb holes in the bottoms of the sleeves. You stick your thumbs through there, that gives you extra coverage on your hands, helps you keep your mitts nice and warm. And to top all of this off, these jackets are handmade in the UK. You cannot ask for more than that. Okay, so us carp anglers are famed for our tea drinking abilities and this month for the What's New section I'm going to look at two products from Ridge Monkey and they're both you know, part of the cookware section. So the first of them is the square kettle and there's two in the range. A lot of people kicked up a fuss about these when Ridge Monkey came out and said they'd made a square kettle. I'm not quite sure why, you know, at the end of the day, a round kettle is round and this one is square and being square it's going to sit inside your bag much nicer you, know, you don't get the wasted spaces at the edge and the other statement they made was that they boil water faster than a round kettle and that caused a right uproar but they've proven themselves time and time again that that is the case you know you're not going to shave minutes and minutes off but this will boil water faster due to the larger surface area at the bottom you know so yeah both kettles have one rather nice little addition on the top of them and that's the double handle and at first when I saw that I couldn't actually work out what it was for but having looked at it I have now realised it is purely for a stability point of view and when I realised that it dawned on me that yeah actually I've used kettles in the past where you've got one wobbly old handle in the middle and the kettle can sort of tilt from side to side of water in ends up going everywhere and possibly burning yourself so double handle keeps it nice and stable so yeah square kettle will boil your tea so it will boil your water for your tea a little bit quicker. And to go with that, they have the new thermal mugs. And as you can see, there's a gray one and a green one. And unlike the kettle, you know, the kettle comes in two sizes, 0.5 and 1.5 liters. These two are exactly the same size. The only difference really is the color. So you've got the gray one here and the green one here. If I just put the gray one down a second, open it up, so the lid's detachable. Inside, you can see you've got nice thick walls there, so you know, it's got a twin wall, which is going to keep it nice and warm, thermal mug, you know, it's got to be doing that at least, hasn't it? So, lid goes back on, there's a little rubber seal there, just ensures the lid sits on nice and tight, and of course, a little sipping hole, as I'm going to call it, so you can still drink it without having to remove the lid. So, yeah, if you want your tea ready fast and to last a bit longer, the kettle will boil your water a little bit quicker, and the old thermal mug will keep it warm for a little bit longer. At this time of year, every year pretty much for the last decade, uh, I find myself looking back at my winter campaign and some of them have been horrible, some of them have been really good fun and this one in particular has been by far one of my most enjoyable yet. I always fish in the winters for several reasons as well, you know. The first thing, the lakes go quiet and in this day and age the lakes are busy all year, you know. The places I fish generally, it's just constant people, you know, and you're fighting them as much as the fish for the most of the time. So. When you get to the winter and they all disappear, it opens up a whole new world of fishing and it is far more enjoyable. You know, you've got the harsh realities of winter and it's going to be cold, it's going to be wet and it's, at times it's going to be horrible. But if you accept that fact and you decide to do a winter, there ain't no good moaning about it because you're never going to change it. You just have to, you know, you either do it or you don't. And of course, coming into the spring like we are now, if you fish throughout the winter, you are you're five, six, seven steps ahead of everybody else, you know, and that when you get into the spring period and those bites start coming thick and fast, which they do, the chances of you being the one that catches more than anybody else is far, far greater. And of course, when you're trying to achieve an ultimate goal, and that is to catch the big one, 
Most big ones get caught in the spring. If you've been there all winter, you've got the finger on the pulse, you've got a much greater chance of that bite coming to you. I followed my whole campaign pretty much throughout my sopography diary and for those of you that have been watching though, the last episode, the last time you saw me, I just had a bit of a mega session and I caught six fish and that was during a really nice spell of weather, you know, 14 degrees, winds, everything you could want really. Um, and that was at the start of December, 6th, 7th of December that was. And since that point, uh, I missed quite a bit of fishing, you know, between that session and the new year. Didn't actually do another night down here, but it snowed and the lake froze about three or four days, I think it was, after that session. Maybe a little bit longer, but you know, not long after that session, the lake froze, um, the snow didn't help, it even made the ice thicker, and by the time that sort of thawed out, we were right up to Christmas, and I don't really fish over Christmas, so I plan to keep coming down and keep the bait going in, but what with all the, uh, the festives going on, I actually didn't, and when I got to the sort of back end of Christmas, I really kicked myself, because I should have kept coming down, I should have kept coming down to bait, you know, and keep my spot that I was fishing at the time, keep that topped up and hopefully keep fish visiting it. But I didn't do that. And like I say, when January arrived, I made sure, you know, to come down and start baiting again. I did a couple of bait ups. I think it was actually just before the new year, the first bait up, but I managed to do two. I uh, came down on the 3rd of January, did a night, didn't catch anything, rocked up quite late, freezing cold, no bites. Uh, but then I came back two days later and first overnight I'd done, I'd actually baited the night before. So I had an idea, you know, when I come down, I thought it's probably a bit too much bait on the spot really. And obviously when I came back a couple of days later, I had a pretty good feeling that bait would have been gone. And sure enough, that night I caught a really nice 24 pound common. Certainly one of the nicest fish I've had from the lake so far. Conditions were absolutely terrible. It was freezing cold. I think it was like minus five, something like that. And to catch a fish in those temperatures, it goes back to what I was saying before about, you know, it can happen when you don't expect it to. And particularly when you're putting the effort in and all that baiting, it really does help. You know, it swings things in your favour when, you know, really, if I hadn't been doing the baiting and that and I'd have turned up and just wanged them out some of that night, I probably wouldn't have caught anything. So that was a right result and a lovely start to the year. baited when I left and then I didn't return for another week. Came down and this time around I was actually going to do a two night session. Prior to that, pretty much every single trip that I'd done had been an overnighter. And to have two nights ahead of me, as you can imagine, I was feeling pretty confident at the prospect of, you know, getting a couple of bites really, but in actual fact, that wasn't to happen. The weather wasn't particularly great and although my rods all went out, you know, I was fishing sweet the whole time, nothing materialised. I had some pretty bad problems from the tufties, which was, mm, I don't know, I sort of took that as a, as a sign that the carp were nowhere near. And that was the only night really that I'd done where the tufties had really been a problem. So I did two nights and both nights they were a pain. And like I say, that just said to me that the carp were elsewhere. So yeah, two night, two night blank. And obviously went away with my tail between my legs, but of course, baited up again. And I think that's key, just keeping the bait going in, whether you catch or whether you don't, just top it back up. And you know, the, the chances are when you're gone at some point, there will be fish turning up to feed. You can't be there all the time when they're eating, but by pre-baiting, you don't need to be there all the time when they're eating. And the more that you're away whilst they're feeding, the better for when you actually arrive to come down and fish. Keen to make up for my two night blank, I came back down, I think it was four days later. This time around I had a night, but I also had the daytime period either side. And as I mentioned, most of the nights I'd done, you know, were just quite short overnighters. Um, I arrived that first day and I saw my first proper signs of fish for quite a while. You know, I hadn't seen a carp jump out of the water for a long time. And on this occasion, I actually found seven or eight fish in a small bay. And they were sitting in really shallow water underneath a weed clump. Um, I did my best to catch one, you know, moved on to them, pinged the rods out, but they just seemed to disappear. And that sort of that chance just drifted away. But, you know, exciting stuff to see fish right in the edge at that time of year, you know, middle of January. That night, I sort of I stayed in that swim because of the fish I'd seen, but because of the spot I'd been baiting, I made sure still to have a rod on that. Bit of a mess around, had to jump in the waders and that and cast it and get it onto position, long story, but that rod actually produced a bite for me and it wasn't a fish that I managed to photograph or film or anything because a couple of fellas turned up just before I had the bite and I really didn't want them to. The last thing you want when you're fishing a lake and you've got it kindly to yourself, it's been nice and quiet, is two dudes to rock up in January and within five minutes of them being there, they see someone catch a carp, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna leave. Um, thinking, yeah, we'll come back here. It's obviously good for a winter bite. So I just unhooked that one, slipped him back. And I think I got away with it, because uh, 
I haven't seen them again since. That was another night um, down, but this time I've managed to catch one and obviously the two night blank was soon put to the back of my mind. It was another four days until I came back down, having baited when I left, you know, I never liked to come back any sooner than two days. But yeah, four days later I came back, 29th of January, so we'd nearly seen January out um, and I had a night ahead of me. The two days previous had been really good weather, I couldn't get down to fish during those, but it was like 13, 14 degrees, really strong winds and because of that I sort of had it in my head that you know it's had two days of the lake being warmed up it's all well and good fishing in those conditions but obviously if you've got 48 hours of it the tail end of that is when the lake's going to be at its warmest you know um, and by that point the weather has obviously taken its toll so I've come back down for the night ping the rods out and that night I had two fish had an absolutely awesome 27 pound common by far one of the best fish I've caught out of this lake and uh, yeah a nice way to finish January that is for certain it was it was a really really cool carp Yeah, boy. Sick one. Mega, isn't he? Yeah, mate. That movie. Proper. This is very hard to hold this one. Crazy shape to him, he's very, very plump. Sort of, a, I want to say he's up front, but he's, I don't know what he is, he's hard to hold. <laughs> That'll do, hard to hold. Incredible mouth. One of his eyes is sort of half closed, I think. Big old rubbery lips, perfect mouth. A proper January bruiser. Biggest one I've had for a while. What a car. Such a cool shape, such, well he's just epic. I'm very, 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 very happy boy this morning. Got a busy day at work today. and go home with a nice big grin on my face. I also had a smaller fish as well that night, a real old looking fish. Another common, about 17 and a half pound, I think he was. Definitely one of the originals, you know. There's a bit of a split stock in this lake. So you've got a real old batch of fish, real gnarly, long, scaly mirrors, and sort of, I don't know, they're funny commons to be fair. They're very, very unique to be fair, these commons in here, the older ones. And then the newer fish, you've got big plump mirrors, and the same for the commons. They look a bit like Redmere commons. Um, but yeah, good night that one, you know. 17 pounder and a 27 pounder at the end of January, and of course, Pre-baited when I left, going into February, big grin on my face and confident of more fish to come. The last day of January was a full moon and I wasn't able to get down and fish on the moon. You know, I always liked to do that, but unfortunately I couldn't, but I did manage to come the next day. So the first day of February, came down to the lake, managed to get there before dark, got my rods out sweet, and that night I caught a really cool fish. 22 pound mirror, big scales along his back. As I've said before, classic of the carp you're going to catch in this lake and one of the newer generation of fish. Well, what a lovely start to February. Came down here yesterday, which was the first, so it's now the second. Yeah, and we've got it off to a flyer. A lovely mirror carp. Came down last night, got here just before it got dark. Seems to be key, I seem to catch a lot more when I get here in the daylight, strangely. But yeah, 22 pound, it's freezing cold, and I'm very happy. Well, we've got an aeroplane going overhead, so if you can hear that, I do apologise, but this is the important bit. Thought I'd quickly spin him round. He's got big old scales all down his back. As I keep going on about, very nice fish. So the spot is still doing bites, you know. By this point, I think I'd had I think I had about 12, 13 fish, something like that, all off the same spot pretty much. And you know, the confidence getting higher and higher all the time. Obviously every week the conditions are getting better and the chances of you catching fish is getting greater. So it's just slowly building, slowly building with this area. Um, and I came back again another few days later to do another night. And I did the night and I sort of, I don't know why I sat there that evening and I thought to myself, 
I feel like I'm not getting as many bites as I actually should have been. You know, quite often I'd get this, I'd get one bite, or but with the baiting I was doing and all that, I started to think there's no one else here to be sort of outdoing me as such. You know, no one else is really fishing the place, and although I'm catching regularly, could I be catching more? Was there, you know, was I missing a trick in somewhat? So woke up that morning having blanked and. Strangely, these, like I say, these sort of negative thoughts were creeping in, and I just, I just felt like I could be doing something better. And the previous night, I'd actually said to me, mate, because I was baiting with so much crumb, maybe fishing these little pop-ups over the top wasn't the best way to go. You know, maybe I needed to switch onto the bottom. Um, anyway, reeled my rods in that morning, and I'm fishing little white pop-ups over the top, and all three of my hook baits, they were like tainted grey. Now. I've been baiting this spot and fishing this spot a lot, so I knew it was clean, and this had never happened before, you know, I've never reeled in grey hook baits. The sort of thing that happens when you sling it in a dirty bit of silt. But that wasn't what I was fishing over, you know, nice firm drops on the same spot I've been fishing all the time. So I've reeled them in grey, and it just made me think, you know, how has that happened and why has that happened? Anyway, I've gone for a wander, and I just see loads of fish in the edge. I see that day I saw pretty much the whole stock, it was just buzzing up and down the margins, sun was out and the fish had just magnetised to the bank and I spent the afternoon, well the early part of the afternoon, watching these fish um, and obviously quite quickly after that decided I need to move and then try fishing for these fish. So I was with my mate at the time, we went round to the other side of the lake and I'm sort of eyeing up where I'm going to fish and what's the best angle to fish from etc. And um, my mate, he's walked up the bank a little bit and he came back and he said, oh your spot's all smoking up. And I didn't really believe it, I didn't think he was lying, I just thought, no, it won't be. It'll just it'll be something else. Anyway, I'm messing around. I've gone, come around to me swim. There's a wind blowing at the time, so I couldn't see this cloud of smoke over the spot. But I've folded all my gear down. I've moved around to the new swim, ping the rods out, and um, he'd walked off the bank while I was sorting my rods out. And he came running back up to me. He's like, "You've got to come and see this. You've got to come and see this." We've walked out the bank, and there's a big, thick, grey cloud of silt just coming up off my area. And quite clearly, what had happened throughout the night is. The fish had been in and they'd cleaned me out. You know, I was fishing really tight off my bait and I, to be honest, it really shocked me the fact that they had got, gone in and done that. You know, I had three rods on an area, tightly baited, all the rigs coming bang on, other than the hook baits had turned grey. And these fish had obviously been out there smashing the spot and just, you know, completely mugged me off. But I'd moved by this point and later that day, I actually lost a fish. I sat there, rods busted off and unfortunately it sort of, it went through the edge of a snag and there was a load of line caught in this snag. The fish had gone through the line and stalemate in the end and had it on a while, but eventually it came off. I managed to get my rig and all that back um, with the line. But yeah, lost fish. And this is my next trip after that. I've not been down since. I've been away skiing for the last few days. Um, or sorry, last week went for skiing for a few days. I haven't been down since, but I did pop in just before I went skiing and the fish were along that same edge again. You know, I saw another, maybe 15 or so. The first time I saw loads, 50 odd. But this second time I saw about 15 fish. Went skiing, I've come back, and this is us now. So, just rocked up um, in this swim because I've seen more fish. Did last night, didn't catch anything. Got here about midnight, and yeah, there's fish along the bank. So I'm gonna get my stuff together. I'm gonna ping a couple of rods over there. And I think it could be a real good chance. You know, they don't look particularly sort of excited, they're not buzzing around like mad or anything, but like I say, it's early, and I think, well, this sun's up, that's obviously while they're there, so I'm gonna creep around the corner and get some rods in position. The sun is in the sky, absolutely beaming down, and because of that, there's a group of fish in the edge. The water's freezing cold, as you can imagine, the time of year, but it's really shallow along here, and with this sun, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that this bit of water along here is going to be a lot warmer than it is out in the pond. Judging by these fish, classic early spring behaviour, they just sat right up in the edge, enjoying the sun. I've got two rods cast across to this margin, and I've now got the horrible task of trying to get a rod in position while this fish about, but it's an area they're obviously uh, keen on being in, so I think even if I do spook them, I've got long enough today, they'll come back. So I'm just going to slip down this edge, this is a really good chance. Slopes like this are never fun when you get your hands full. And you're trying not to make too much noise. It's a lovely clean bottom down here. End of the winter, all the weeds died back. It's just 
Just a few real shallow gravelly spots exposed. First things first, try and get one of these washing lines in. For anyone that doesn't know, washing line is basically the act of putting a pole in the ground, rig across to it and the line goes off the pole down into the water. Let's get this in place. They're not going to like this, not one bit. Worst. Nothing like being discreet. Come on, here we go. That's it. We're in. Right, that's the old bit. Now I've got to get me line out the tree. Check the fish don't see me. This is where my new waterproof trainers come in handy. Cool, that was lucky. That's the line. Under the other one. Yeah, that's the one. Oh shit. Patties on properly. Now I need to get enough line to reach the spot basically. Hopefully that's enough. Rush it around my hand a few times. You don't want to let that go. Put all this line through your hand. I'll soon be in a position to attach the rig. Right. That's that. Rig board. Bait and spoon. Wrong way around. That, oh, that wasn't a good idea. I want that second section. to go. Rig. On. Leads in my pocket. Bit of foam as well. Let me foam, there's my lead. Foam the hook up quickly. This little bit of foam this enables me if it does drop onto a spot that I'm not totally buzzing with give me a couple of seconds just to tweak it into place and obviously because of where it is I'll be able to see this on the bottom so lead in lead on sorry rigging the spoon All right but you have to hope you guessed the amount of line you'd need correctly. Plenty there. That have probably got a bit too much, but there's a lovely little bit of clean ground there. So we'll give it out the spoon. It's actually landed. Just in the edge of the spot. Perfect. See my line hung up on a little twig there. Let's drop that down. There we go. Line lays kosher. 
Prime was still on, that pop up was just sitting up. Still sat there. Right. I'm gonna have to pick this slack up in a minute. Any fishies turn up? Right, I'm just tucking the. I'm not actually a million percent happy with that. How's that going to sit? Perfect. It's actually sat perfect. <laughs> Wicked. Right. So I've basically I've tucked my line underneath this hairband, which is around the top of my storm pole. I'm just going to tighten that up slightly. Put that into the tree, keep it out of the way. So I'm going to have to go to the swim and tighten that up. Got a little loop there in the top of the pole. Just going to use a little bit of reed. the line with when you get by that just bust off there no problem let's get that tight again all right quickly go and tighten that up oh. Right, that's that one tightened up. Now for the other rod. Same process again. Locate your line. Spoon. Horrible doing all this when there's carp about. You just feel like you're smashing your swim to pieces, but once they're in, it all becomes worth it. Observation is always going to play a huge part in your fishing and never is that going to be more apparent than in the winter months. If 15 times you check a bush you don't see anything, why would you keep checking it? But it might be the 20th time you check, you see them there again and a chance emerges and that's the really important thing with the winter. Getting these chances, putting yourself in positions where you know, you've got bites on the cards. If they favour those areas they use them for a reason and at some point they're going to go there again. Right, well from up here I can just see my pop-up, I'm sure you can see it as well. Now that's about to come off. Please fall away towards the lake. Typical winter. Frame's, frame isn't fresh, it's pretty important to use fresh frame at this time of year, but I thought I'd get away with it. It'll come off though, I'm going to make sure it does. If it doesn't, worst case I'll have to give it a little nudge with a pole, that'll knock it off, but 
That'll pop off any second, I'm sure. The rigs are sweet, they're properly in position. There's carp beyond it as well, so it's looking good. It's looking really good. There you go, there's the foam. Oh, look. That'll be fishing fine, there's no doubt about that. So I'm going to get back round. What is damn hot over here? Final piece of the puzzle, bobbins on. You're fishing for dropbacks. <laughs> bobbins up to the top. Clutch is tight, locked up. So what's going to happen is you're going to get that bite and bust out the uh, out the hairband. It's all just going to drop slack, and then it's game on. Wallet. Probably for the last decade I've done every winter and sometimes it hasn't really paid off. You know, you fish all winter, you have a few bites, the odd opportunity arises and you catch a few and that's great but that's about it really. But there has been other times where, you know, I've caught some, caught some big fish over the winters, I've caught some target fish throughout the cold and when you actually achieve that, it is so much better than doing it in the summer. Um, the effort that's gone into it is generally greater and just the expectancy, you know, you don't expect it to happen in the winter. but. It can, and it does, and that is why I make sure I go. The rods have looked like they were just going to do nothing. Checked multiple times, hadn't seen a fish in the area for ages. Getting towards the end of the day, and out of the blue, it's busted off. Bit of a nightmare playing this one, he's right underneath me other rods. Ooh, right underneath them. He's under that other rod. It's a common. It's not a big fish. It looks nice and dark. It's going to reach for me net. Come away from that line, mate. Oh. It's the little round common that I saw. Just waiting for him to pick my left hand rod up. Come on. It's literally right under there. Look, under me lines. It's a little common. I see this one this morning. He's obviously rocked back up. Smallest fish I've seen all day, definitely. As I said this morning, I'll take anything today. Come on. It's upside down. <laughs> hey, lovely jubbly. I've definitely caught this fish before. It's the one I caught wearing my Christmas hat. Sun is dropping behind the trees. I'm a very happy carp angler. And this fish is one, not very happy about being held. 
but two is a result of acting on some very simple observation really you know just taking the time to walk around the lake spotting a few fish seeing fish in the extreme margins isn't what you'd expect for the time of year but that's carp fishing for you and by putting two rods where i'd seen those carp this morning it's been a little while and uh, all the fish seem to have disappeared i've been checking nothing there this chap's obviously came back in he's a recapture but never mind i'm a happy boy and i'm going to move now because i think the chance here is probably over and my best bet of another bite is going to be out in the pond so i'll do tonight hopefully we'll nick one out of the open water and then tomorrow I'll probably move back into this corner because it's going to be sunny again and i've got a pretty good feeling this one's mates will be back Times like this, when you stick your hands into that freezing cold water with a carp, it makes it all worth it. <laughs> Off you go, mate. You look at all the different situations I've used it in, all the different lakes that I've used it on, you know. It's quite rare to stumble across something like that and I have so much confidence in it that that's why I've been using it. But it also plays perfectly into my hands because I can turn up after dark, I can put the rods out knowing that the rig will not tangle and the fish never fall off of them. And it's very versatile. When you're fishing in the winter and bites are hard to come by, that is really important. As I come into the spring, I'm feeling good. When you sat a winter out, when that spring arrives, you're absolutely buzzing and you turn up to the lake full of energy, more and more and more, because every week it's getting better and better. That horrible winter period starts to become more of a distant memory. And I absolutely love it. Day number two has turned very much into the same day as yesterday. Beautiful sunrise this morning and that sun is now up in the sky, beaming down on the lake. It looks beautiful, it's lovely and warm and I've moved swims. Obviously I moved last night just before it got dark, ping my rods out over bait and to be honest I was expecting a fish but nothing happened, just a tench in the middle of the night. Didn't recast that rod so I had three rods on the area so just chucked the little pink pop up on top of the bivvy, chucked the rod in the tree, woke up this morning, moved pretty much straight away as soon as that sun came out come down to the corner for a little check and I saw fish pretty much straight away so obvious decision was to just fold the gear down move into here and I've just repeated the process that I used yesterday and getting my rods out so two rods across to the far side on the washing line it's a great way of keeping your lines out the water you know I'm able to fish a really tight line down to the corner there's only six foot of line off the front of the poles or so so as soon as it busts off the pole you know, I get great indication, one straight into the fish, and those fish are going to bolt out of that corner. Because I'm fishing right up against the far bank, you know, the obvious thing for them to do is just come straight out. So, Bobbin will just drop the floor like yesterday, and the fish will swing out the bay. But um, yeah, there's carp in there. The rods are perfectly in position. Much happier with them than I was yesterday, to be quite honest. Actually fishing a swim, you get to judge and see what's happened, make a few tweaks and changes, and this morning they are perfectly in position, and I wouldn't change them for the world. There's fish there, so I think I've got a good chance. Shame I didn't catch anything last night, but all the coots, the tufties, are all zipping around the lake, and they all just seem to be excited in the spring sunshine. It's absolutely no surprise, to be quite honest. It's been a uh, a pretty cold winter and these days of sun are just everything's going to start livening up you know the fish are certainly going to do the same and that tench that i caught last night you know that's always a good sign those early tench once you start getting the bites from them you know the lake's waking up and i didn't think there was many tench in it but you know it's a sure sign that there is so they're waking up the carp are waking up and uh it's all to play for i reckon <laughs>
darn it. Just lost one. There's loads of birds out there. That hook is knackered, so. Ah, oh, here one. Zigging for you. <laughs> Just had a bite on my left hand rod, which came off. I picked this rod up to reel this one in to rechuck it, and it's I don't know what's going on. Wound back, went solid, and now I'm pumping something really heavy that isn't moving in. Weird. A lot of pressure now. I don't know what is going on here. What on earth is this going to be? If it's a car, it's definitely going to be a 60, so... I reckon my zig snapped and whatever's attached is attached to my line. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Bucket full of silt. <laughs> Jesus, that was heavy. There's no doubt in my mind that a huge part of the success that I've had has been down to the pre-baiting. I've been using borley crumb and a bit of corn. You don't have to use loads of bait. I've been putting quite a lot of bait in, mainly because there's been not really anyone else fishing the place. The crumb is there to give me you know, the longevity of the bait being on the spot for ages and having the carp plenty of time to turn up and get to it. And the corn is there as a bit of a beacon. You know, Carp love sweet corn, there's no doubt about that. It's very easy for them to consume during the winter, it's full of water. So a load of corn on the spot, a load of borley crumb on the spot. They're doing two different things, but that, that bright yellow, you know, I've been putting a red bait out, plenty visible, but it's not visible like corn is. And to that bait, I've been adding a load of powders, a load of liquids, just trying to sort of create as much attraction as possible and have food in the water that's going to be performing well for me for as long as possible. With your crumb, your liquids and your powders, you're ensuring that that's going to happen. It sinks into the ground almost. And between that combination of bait, it is out there doing a job for you for that whole three or four day period that you're not there between baiting. So I bait on a Monday, by the time I come back to fish, that bait has been out there doing it. Every chance it's been eaten. And if it's not, it's, there's not too much there. You know, if the fish do turn up, you put your hook baits out there, they're the sort of obvious beacon. So even if there is bait sat on the spot, you could turn up, put three brights out, and you still get a bite. Well, I'm going to recast my rods for the night. I'm going to stay another night, but this may well be the last time you see me. I've got to be off early doors, so the light's just going now. I'm going to rechuck these. I'm going to stay in this swim tonight, and that's that. So if I don't catch anything, you won't see me again. you weren't going to see me again unless I was lucky enough to catch a fish and the fact that you're looking at me now can only be good news. I've got a 26 pound mirror in the sack and the lake is, I reckon the lake must be 85% frozen over. That's an absolute result. Kettle's just boiled for the first brew of the day. I've packed half my gear down. I'm off in a bit. I thought I'd fold that down, warm myself up a little bit, get the kettle on and get ready to get the carp out. He's, um, yeah, he's a big plump grey leathery thing. Not the most beautiful carp in the world, by any stretch, but he's, um, he's a cool fish. And yeah, certainly, <laughs> certainly made the choice to stay that last night worthwhile. And a bit of swan trouble in the night as well, going for me lions. So 
ups and downs, but beautiful morning again. That sun has just come up above the trees on the far side. Bit of mist in the air, looks beautiful. So I'm gonna have my drink and I'll get my carp out. Well, this is by far the coldest my hand has been all winter while holding a carp. No doubt because half the lake's frozen, but what a fish. Levery as you like, chunky as you like. It's quite hard to hold to be fair. And my hands are going numb. So I'm gonna spin him around very quickly and then we'll get him back. Once these numb hands put this carp down. There you go. What a lovely way to end not only my session, but this film. Okay, this month we're going to be doing chicken fajitas in the Ridge Monkey XL. So I'll get it on, get it hot. With the baffles on the top, it doesn't take very long for these to get hot. Now the Ridge Monkey XL is hot, get our spray oil in. So now we've got the oil smoking hot, get our chicken fillets. Open the packet. These are handy packets, it's already stripped up. If I'd got chicken breasts, I would have sliced it at home and probably put the spices and the oil in it as well. Put the chicken in the smoking oil, nice and you can hear that sizzling hot, sealing the meat all straight away. Once the chicken's turned and sealed, can close the lid, seals in the heat, keeps the moisture in the chicken and we'll leave that to cook through for three to four minutes like that. But obviously you don't need to turn the chicken anymore, we can just flip the Ridge Monkey XL over. Right, so once we've flipped it over, the chicken's all nicely sealed can add our vegetables that we've prepared at home, put in a bag and brought them with us already. No chopping on the bank, all nice and easy. Close the lid, all your vegetables, chicken in there, cooking together, the flavours mixing lovely. Okay, so we'll open up the Ridge Monkey. As we can see, it's all colouring beautifully. In fact, I'd say it's nearly time to add our fajita spice. I prefer the Cajun. It's basically the same thing. I just find the Cajun is slightly spicier, which is to my taste. A good dose all over. Close the lid and give it a good all over shake. Just check, make sure we've got an even covering. Oh, yes, a nice even covering just like that. And I wish you could smell this because it smells absolutely amazing. All we've got to do now is put our wraps together and call the lads over for some tea. Simply take a wrap, take a bit of chicken, Some of your nice peppers and onion mixture and simply roll. Okay, so there's the first one. Should get about four wraps out of this, couple each. Again, a couple of pieces of chicken, some peppers and onions. And again, just roll and onto the plate. Keep going with all your mixture until it's all gone. And trust me, it will be all gone. And onto the plate, that's it. Fajitas, done. So we're back to Kurt's score with health ability again. And this week we have the chicken fajitas. Chicken, minimum oil, peppers, onions. What's not to like? Healthy. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha
I'll probably say whilst fishing a big pit in the Cotswolds. Uh, I was told when we bought the ticket, do not get seen out in the boat. Do what you want under the cover of darkness, but do not get seen in the boat. It was owned by like the fire banks or caravans and it's like a wakeboarding lake, so they own the lake. Uh, so yeah, strictly do not go out in the boat. But um, a mate of mine, he had the crayfish, like like you went around doing all the crayfish, or like on the pots, he had like 40 pots off all the islands all around the lake and stuff. Red hot day, flat car, middle of summer, and I thought, I'm just gonna, you know, stick on the same colour jacket he does and just, no, 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 like, tell the difference. Just have a good look around the lake. So yeah, I took it upon myself to sort of have a little mooch round. I'd never used a petrol engine either, so I can remember sort of got it going, and I couldn't get it going for ages, you know, eventually got it going, but meh, nothing. <laughs> Sent the thing halfway up the bank, you know, I thought, oh, shit, I'll, I'll go break it. Luckily, then, soon got the hang of it. You know, you talk like a big sort of 15 foot hard plastic boat, petrol engine, and uh, yeah, just sort of took myself around the lake. But from doing so, I'd sort of stumbled across a little area and a few fish that sort of led onto the capture of the big one. So the biggest stroke that certainly paid off was dressing up and going out, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. I'd say probably the strangest things that have happened to me while I've been on the bank have probably been whilst fishing up in the Lee Valley. Um, you know, sort of bit they're open to the public 24-7, you know, all park lakes essentially. Um, yeah, I've had things from being woken up in the middle of the night to police helicopters hovering above your swim, dog units running up and down the paths behind you. Um, I've had kids setting off boxes of fireworks behind me swim in the middle of the night. I've had Jehovah's Witnesses coming in me swim, offering me leaflets to read while I sit there. Um, you know, there's yeah, all sorts. Probably the probably the strangest thing, um, the most uncomfortable thing that's happened to me was uh, lake I was fishing in the Lee Valley last year. I had fish fish in the net, and uh, family have walked past on the footpath behind me, and um, you know noticed noticed I was messing around with my net in the edge and uh, guys sort of looked and started speaking to me in like an like Eastern European accent and he's kind of seen I've got a carp in the net and kind of like rushed to the front of me swim almost barging me out the way to have a look sort of thing and I'm like oh wait a minute <laughs> and then all of a sudden he sort of beckoned over his friend and before I know I've got sort of like two blokes at the front of me swim sort of like looking at the carp in my net and, uh, and they were sort of offering to take it off my hands pretty much <laughs> and uh, so uh, yeah, it made me feel pretty uncomfortable, and I kind of uh, got into the water with the fish. Basically, uh, yeah, told them where to go and uh, please get out of my swim in the nice, politest way possible. <laughs> and as soon as uh, they disappeared, they disappeared out of sight. I got the fish out as quick as I could, done some self takes, and got it back as quick as uh, humanly possible. <laughs> Right, well, I may have mentioned many times in the past that I get the very fortunate job of photographing a hell of a lot of carp for my friends, you know, doing the job that I do. Um, they rely on me to do their pictures, and one of my best friends, Luke Stevenson, has rung me this morning. He's caught his target fish. I'm at St Ives Lake in Cambridge on the shallow pit. Um, I've never been here before. The complex looks absolutely beautiful. Makes me wonder why I've not been here before. The fish is epic. I've never seen it on the bank, obviously, but I've seen pictures and I've lived this story with Luke the whole way through. You know, he's had a couple of years away from this lake until this season. He battered him a couple of years ago. He's come back and he's been battering him again. It was a matter of time. Um, he deserves it so, so much. And I've been, like I say, I've the conversations we've had over the years with this fish, it's, he's caught everything out of this lake, you know, more than once. Um, and yeah, I'll let him tell the story properly, but he's going to be absolutely buzzing. I can't wait. He deserves it so much. And, you know, providing I've got enough batteries in this bag, I've got, a, I was fishing last night. I think I've got about, I might have one, but the others are running out. But yeah, I'm going to get around to see Luke because uh, I can't wait to see him and his fish. And uh, he probably can't wait to see me either. So. Let's go. Look at him. Looks like a 20, doesn't it? Yeah. I definitely hope. I hope it's 22 band, I hope it is. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Own back end, son. 
What's going on here? Where'd you get them? Mate, they are old school. <laughs> Yes! Yes, Luke. Mate, is he happy? End to end, yeah. Yeah. Mate, that's savage. Hang on. Let's go real slow. Let's go real slow. Let's go real slow. Right. Yes! Buzzing. Is he on it? Isn't it? He is. Yeah. There's that old mouth. Proper, I remember that old mouth. Proper bottom bait hook. Yeah. Little mouth, isn't he? For a big fish? Yeah. Okay, and again. Yeah. Hang on. Hang on. Caught out. Do this end up. Got rings, isn't it? On your shoulder. Right. Fifty one. Six, fifty one, four. You want to put it there? See it, mate. 51.4, mate. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do. Oh, yes, mate. Hello, doggy. Tell me when you're happy, yeah? Happy. Right. Stay there. Oh, nice and still. Mega, mega cut. Yeah, like it is old already, isn't it? Like Looks like an absolute orange ball bag, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, tail up, mate, that side. That's it. Stay still, mate. That's it. Right. Well, yeah. Mate, I've got a pack of shots on both, mate. Yes! Right, tail towards me a tiny bit, Luke, that's it. In fact, turn this way a bit more. Do both sides if I do, mate.
go on, isn't they? Yeah, just literally dragged it in. Yeah, weed it up. Yeah. I was sort of aware of it and then I saw pictures of it. Um, so 46, 47, that sort of thing, I think. Um, when I came to actually have a go for it, I suppose that got caught at 48 pounds, I think it was. Um, it was quite, quite, quite quiet, relatively. It was in the shadow of the lake, the lagoon, really. Where the lady used to live. Yeah, yeah. 60 pounds. Yeah, it was just a big, and there weren't loads of biggins around at the time. Not as, not as many as there are now, so it was a bit more, you know, n n sort of, I suppose, niche or whatever, I don't know. But, um, so, um, so I, I did a sort of a year on here then, did a season, caught quite a few, sort of felt a bit aggrieved to have not caught it really. I felt close and, you know. How many did you catch? Um, I think I had 40 captures in a year, which was sort of, uh, or just over, so a, a year and maybe two weeks into the next ticket, something like that. How quite, many fish were in the lake? I don't know exactly. Um, maybe 60. It's a lot of fish. Something like that, yeah. quite a few, yeah. I remember um, talking to you one night quite early on. It might have been your first one. Remember the big fish you lost in the tree? Mm. Yeah, that was um, that was my first bite. That was. Um, it got caught that spring in the May, uh, and then um, so I gave it. I had a. It got caught the morning I was due to come down for quite a few few nights. I had some holiday. That was, I was. Bit, bit all revved up then with nowhere to go, so I didn't bother coming down. I should have done really. I should have just come down. I hadn't had a fish out there yet, so do you know what I mean? I should have just been stupid really. But so I went elsewhere for a couple of nights, and I thought, oh bugger this, I'm coming back down, um, or, or the next or the next week or whatever. So I came down. I'm sure, it, yeah, it was about two weeks later, um, ten days or two weeks. Anyway, so I found some fish in this little out of boundsy bit and milling about near it and what have you, and it was soaking wet. By the time I come to set up, I was so wet, I was, I in the end took all me, so I flicked a couple of rods out anyway, chucked a few baits around each, sort of half-heartedly really, because I was soaking wet, took all my clothes off, got in the sleeping bag, uh, freezing cold, and although it was summer, it was just f***ing dire, all my stuff was, 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 uh, was wet through. Anyway, so I got a take in the night, playing this fish in, it's beasting me, quite a big fish. And it done me on um, down my margin. It was like I remember thinking about it now. I, I knew it was there, but it was like a, a branch had fallen in, so it was laying down flat on the water, gnarly old sort of bit of dead wood. And it got caught around that, and um, it was just going bang, bang on this. Just it was like lodged up on it, and you know tethered to it really. Um, but I, I heard it, it like a, a thud, thudding noise, a real big, and I could sort of see it from down the margin with my head torch. So I went down there and went right over my waders, come back, took them off, went back down there again. I'm slipping down the slope and up to the branch in my hair, lying caught everywhere, dark. Uh, and in the end, it hook pulled me, you know. And uh, that was a big one. And I can't say it was it, definitely. I know it was a big fish, but um, 
maybe stood to reason that it got caught and it might have been in in the out of bounds, sulking, yeah, and no, it makes sense. And have caught so many and not caught that one, wouldn't it? Yeah, maybe you know. And uh, I, 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 there was another bite I got that year from an area I've been catching fish from, and quite a few good ones as well. And it was a night bite, and it did do, do night bites. That one does do night bites. I always thought I'd catch it at night, but um, I got this bite, and it sort of again when I look back now, I caught it. it was the same sort of bite, really flat rodded me, really took loads of line, dummy in the weed hook pulled me in the night, you know. I think it was sandwiched either side of a couple of big fish I had, a 40 pounder and another one. And I just think, oh, what, you know what I mean? It could have, what could have been? You never know, do you, unless you see them. Oh, but, um, but yeah, in hindsight, I might, might have lost it. Might not have, but um, it did only get caught once that year. So someone's lost it, I think. There's a shallower area with some dot islands in, um, which they would always go to in the spring. Um, partly because it's shallow, partly because it's an out of boundsy type bit, but also there's, before the weed gets up out, out in the lake, then as soon as that does sort of happen by sort of June, July time, they spend less and less time in there and more time out, out in the main lake, I suppose. That, that's the out of bounds through there, and this is the nearest you can get to them. But yeah, they, they definitely use it a lot. I, I've caught a few from, from here. Yeah, caught one early on this, this year from out here, but there's a so it's an out of bounds, but you're allowed to go round there and wade onto a little island and uh, get a good view of them. Um, obviously not allowed to fish round there, but I've never actually, um, you know, you see all the, name all the different fish, but I've never actually seen the big one in there. If the big one came in there, I'm sure you'd, uh, you, you'd know it straight away, I've, but I've never seen it in there, but I get in there most days when I'm, when I'm fishing the lake. Uh, certainly early on, you know, um, and I'm often looking for it. Um, but no, I've never seen a definite sighting of it actually swimming. Um, I've seen the, the odd big fish show, which could, could well be it, but not, not 100%, which is quite rare. Yeah, usually you sort of, you, you, you see you see the one you're after um, over, over the years, you get glimpses of them, don't you, from, from up trees and, and different things, but it's bizarre. It must be the only fish I've not actually seen in the water, which is odd. As soon as you get in here, get up this tree and see exactly which ones are in here. There's a big set of pads here and they'll be under there. You, you won't see them, you'll just see the pads rock every now and again. And if you're in this end of the lake, you'll often, uh, there's some gaps in these islands and you'll often see them through the gaps showing in the evening as they're coming out and that sort of thing. There's not a lot about. But every lake I've ever fished with an out of bounds, of the, they're always just sort of drawn to them, aren't they, the fish? It's like a, what I often find on here is um, <clears throat> certainly earlier, earlier season. When, when soon as the lake gets busy and there's a few anglers on, they'll get in here straight away. You only need a sort of a few, few anglers and they're very, very aware. You know, it's only small, what, 12 acres or whatever it is, 10 acres. Um, there are, as soon as there's a few rigs going in and people are spawning and leading about and that sort of thing, uh, they'll be in here, you know, even if the weather's not right for it. You can get here on a Thursday and there won't be, there won't be any fish in here and it'll be hot and yet it will go all sort of carpy where you'd think they'd be out in the, out in the pond and out in the deeper water or whatever, um, on, say on the Friday and it'll get busy and they'll be in here. So uh, it's completely it's sort of um, de angler dependent a lot of the time and pressure dependent, but um, they do love it in here. It can be frustrating at times, I suppose, but I mean, 
I think the times you're seeing them in here anyway, I mean, they're, they're, they're not really the times you're getting the bites out there anyway, so uh, try and take a positive from it and you're able to get your rods out without them being aware of you, I suppose. But with this weed up out in the lake now, uh, they can be sitting out in that, out in open water during the days and laying up and that sort of thing. After that year, <clears throat> I joined, rejoined the next year, but it was really very busy in the spring, which is the norm, you know. But I, because I was sort of used to it a little bit quieter, it was like a bit of a culture shock. And um, I'd just bought a house that year with my girlfriend, um, sort of my first house, and, and did a load of work on that. So um, fishing took a, a bit of a backseat. I did a bit of local fishing, but um, sort of wasn't in, in, in you know, I can't, can only really concentrate on one thing at once. and. Uh, so that was, yeah, it was the house and that was my priority. So, so then I joined elsewhere a couple of years later, or for a couple of years after that, two seasons and did a bit of fish. But this was always on my mind, I this one. All the time you were, all the time you were fishing that lake, I kept, you kept going, oh, I don't know where I'm going to go do it. And I kept saying to you, go back to the shallow, you've caught, you will catch it, just go back. Yeah, catch it. yeah, all my friends, I, I, you, you know, I, I listen to all my friends. They're the only people I really care about whose opinions matter when, you know, you show your pictures too and all that sort of stuff. And, and everyone's always said it and I don't know, it was niggling me. It was like it, it, I felt like um, I'd sort of failed a little bit, you know, I'd, I'd set, I'd, I'd started something and hadn't finished it and I hated that. It was in the back of my mind and I thought, no, do you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go go back, fish for it and um, whether it's, it's, it's really unenjoyable and busy and or, or, or not, whatever, whatever it may be. It's, go back till it's done you know what I mean and um, you know it, you know it got caught this this year it's been caught twice and so maybe I didn't go it down for a week afterwards or so but that was it there was no the next week I'd be down and I mean there was only probably mm, maybe one other sort of of the better fish sort of the bigger like the 30s and that sort of thing that I hadn't caught so there weren't a lot else to be to be fishing for along the way you know what I mean it was that one really it was just that one um, but I, so earlier in the season, uh, I caught this one particular other fish that I, I really wanted in the out. Real, real cracker. It's a, like a linear, quite rare fish. Doesn't get caught a lot. Um, so it does 36, 37, 38 pound. Um, and I caught it. Yeah, just uh, just after spawning, sort of 34 and a half or something. But look, but looked it. real good still. You know, looked really, you really impressive. Session, didn't you as well? Yeah, I had a really good session. Yeah, I caught. Um, I, caught, I think I caught six fish, uh, three 35 pounders, um, one 34 and one just over 30. But they'd all spawned, you know, they're all big rare fish, you know, they're all like two of the 18, you know, two of the, they do 40 pound, uh, a couple of mid 30s, uh, the upper 30s down to sort of 35, you know what I mean? They're, so I felt really close, I, I thought all the time there must be Colin's mates out there, do you know what I mean? It must have had a feed. Must have were, been near it at some point. I bet you were um, really keen to tell everyone as well as, as you were catching up. Yeah, I couldn't wait to tell everyone. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, Did you, was you, you, was keep, you was obviously keeping it quiet? Right? Well, yes and no. Like, you have to, don't you? You do to an extent, but also that some of the lads you're fishing with, you, you've got respect for and you're not going to completely mug them off. Do you know what I mean? There is there is that, that side to carp fishing. It's, it's a bit of a, a line that you... To an extent, you've got to be a bit, a little bit, um, I don't know, a bit subtle and a bit, um, I don't know. Don't tell, white, tell white lies over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To change the and subject. Truth, change the change, 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 bit, bit, bit economical with um, what you talk about. But uh, yeah, it's all, it's all part of the fun, isn't it? You know. Uh, you almost get to a, you sort of uh, think like that fish and you, you're getting into its head and where does it live and those particular areas. Well, you do anyway, but when it's, it's all about one fish. You're looking at past captures and 
different things like that. You, you know, you're, you're thinking about it all the time. It's not always fun either. Is it? No, not really. You know, you, you've done the whole bites thing and you've got bites. I always try and like, you know, I go onto a lake and I try and get bites. And the ones that you're really after, they come along, but it's just nice to catch a carp along the way. And it sort of got beyond that a little bit and all I'm, it becomes, yeah, just very one track minded. And, um, you know, when it gets caught, you're obviously going to be really gutted, you know, really happy for someone. But, but then it's the case of you've just got to get straight back to it and, you know, so otherwise, it, you know, it, it just doesn't get done. Otherwise, you know. One of the best things about this place is that, you know, there's loads of lakes and they're all big, sort of quiet lakes, really. Um, and there's, uh, there's fish to be found everywhere. I mean, we've, we've found fish on, what, on three lakes without really trying. And there's always something going on somewhere. It's really interesting. Everywhere you walk, there's water, you know, and we've just found some fish in this corner on, on another lake, which is just sort of separated by a narrow spit of land to the shallow. This is the little fjords. There's a lot of fish in, in this one, you know, uh, and so it, it, there's distractions everywhere you look. I mean, there's, there's a couple in here now. We're just watching under the scum. Easy to get sort of distracted and, and end up doing a bit here, there and everywhere. Um, sometimes you just got to be completely tunnel vision and sort of not get distracted and sort of almost purposely don't look on these other bits of water, you know, because if you're not careful, you end up getting up a tree and finding them and and then wanting to have a go, and before you know it, you, 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 you know, you're completely distracted and sort of last thing you want, really. How did it actually pan out? We started quite slow. Uh, <clears throat> they were quite... Um, the lake had changed from what I knew of it years sort of back and when I fished it, you know, it was, um, it was the water's a bit lower and um, obviously the weed, the weed wasn't up early on and uh, the first few fish got caught from a deep corner up the other end of the lake, which usually is a bit of a write off, you know, um, it's just how lakes evolve, I suppose, and they, you know, respond to angling pressure and that it's become a bit, you know, a bit more of a, a busy lake, you know over the last few years. Maybe that's something to do with it. Maybe that was where the first bit of weed was. I'm not, not quite sure. But um, as it's gone on, it's gone back to what I remember and how I know the lake <clears throat> in as much as um, there's a couple of areas I, I knew I had to be in, really. Um, there's a bit of a sort of a, um, a, the shallower end of the lake. One, one swim on one side of the bank and two, the other swim, uh, other side of the, uh, on the other bank, sort of opposite and they both fish to a sort of a, um, like a Bermuda Triangle, I suppose, of about 100 yards square, which you can get up to the middle of, you know, uh, the edges of, you know, uh, quite shallow water, quite a lot of weed, and they spend a lot of time out there. That's out in the lake? Out in the lake, yeah. Yeah, this time of year, once the weed gets up, they, that's where they sort of like it. Um, and I knew I had to be in, in my head, I had to be in one or two swims um, for that one. Those were areas which I, I, I had been getting in. Um, and, and catching from sort of pretty pretty consistently had a couple of areas certainly one area that I that I'd been fishing and baiting and and catching from quite regularly it was an area I'd fished a few years back as well it was a, it, again it's fishing quite long up to an area where they spend a lot of time but it was a presentable sort of spot a lot of it out there is very shallow very weedy um, I'd be you get sort of a quite a hard drop but you, you didn't get a drag back so it's a, like a, a thin layer of like flattened down Canadian, you know, quite presentable, nice, nice to present a pop-up over. But I'd been fishing that um, and baiting it quite heavily. It's in quite quite a bit over the over quite a few sessions, you know. And um, the last couple of trips, I'd been fishing it with pop-ups, um, but it's just been getting, I'd get in a massive crackdown, but I'd get a real, real nice clean pullback. It'd become too, too quite blatant. I remember back a few years ago when I was fishing that area in that swim, it got to a point where that spot it just sort of blew, it just became too barren and I just, they just weren't, I just wasn't catching off it, I don't think they were eating off of it. So anyway, it, it, I was worried it was getting like that again and, um, and I was going through the same fish again and again, a couple of fish I'd caught three times, you know, and these are the, the better fish, the, the, or not the, well, the rarer ones, the bigger, bigger fish and that sort of thing. 
Uh, it got to a point where I thought, well, something's got to change, you know, either the baiting has got to change or my rig, because there's got to be something in it. Well, I've caught too many to have not caught it, just for it to be a bit out of It's too much of a coincidence. Um, so yeah, sure enough, um, when, when, I had, when I had Colin that night, um, the, the spot I was, I was fishing over had become so clean that um, I, I put a bottom bait out. First time, well, I think second or third time I've ever put a bottom bait out, really. Um, and no, no, I never caught on a bottom bait out there. Never, never really needed to, because the areas I was fishing were always a bit dirty and weedy and just crying out for a pop-up. I'm, I'm, you know, I like to use a bottom bait, but not, not when it's, you know, only when it's real perfectly clean. And, and to be honest, I, I try and shy away from the areas on here anyway, because I've, I've been doing so well. Uh, maybe that was part of the problem, because I've been get, getting some, so many bites one way, maybe that wasn't helping, because I, it needed to be another way for that one. I don't, I don't know, it's hindsight, isn't it? But um, yeah, so anyway, that, I'd seen coots picking up bait off my spot, uh, off the sides of my spot that day that day through the binoculars um, and um, every time they dived on the middle of the spot the sweet the sweet spot sort of thing they weren't coming up with any bait so I thought well that and also I'd seen a bit of fizzing that morning over the rod and nothing materialized so I thought oh you know I'll, I put got to put bottom bait out there tonight so um, so I did I put bottom bait out there the spawning went perfectly um, I sat back and I thought, oh, well, I don't know, it's only a night, isn't it, if it's not right, and reassess. I started to doubt the spot a little bit. It'd become, bites had started to slow down on it. Um, I thought it'd become maybe a bit too blatant and clean. So anyway, I put this rod out and the spawning all went perfect, the rod went sweet, and it was just a real, I wasn't feeling it. And then by the end of the night, once the rods were out, it was a bit of drizzle, I had my dinner, I was really sort of, it was just a lovely evening, do you know what I mean? I spoke to you on the phone that night. And you were telling me when, um, he said, did, uh, did you know what happened when Miles caught, caught it? I said, no, not really. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, beasted me, you know, he beasted him, beasted him, beasted him, and black rodded him, and then went round the back of a weed bed and thrashing about, about on the surface and almost jumping out of the water and stuff like that. And so I went to bed thinking about that. And, uh, you know, uh, so the next morning, anyway, just, just on light, the bite boat woke me up, actually. So it was just before sort of proper light. Um, so I got a bite, went out, picked the rod up, took line, took line, took line, like they usually do, and they usually sort of just sort of slow down and then you end up sort of sort of gingerly pumping them back with a bit of weed usually. Anyway, this didn't, it was different. It kept and every time it did slow down, I think I'm just starting to get the rod up in the air looking at it and it's just sort of coming just before I sort of crank again, that pulls the rod back down. And, Got a backwind another few turns and it did that four or five times and then then it did start to go solid but I could as I looked out there I could see a big set of rings behind a bit of weed and I knew it was it on the surface and I'm just going through my head and I'm thinking oh this is it you know but we got him on here so uh, we've got the, the the boat was in my swim uh, you're allowed to go out for sort of weeded fish so I, I put the rod down I put the life jacket on and I'm sort of psyching myself up for it I'm always sort of talking out loud to myself saying oh this is it you know so I did the life jacket up and uh, got the rod, you know, reeled myself out to this fish with the oars in the net and uh, uh, or, or, or in the um, net is in the boat. So I got out over the area and um, I'm pulling the line, sort of, you know, I've got, almost got the lead core in my, my hand and it sort of kicked again. So I thought, oh, I better, you know, play it with the rod. So as I've done that, sort of bit of line is twisted around the rod. It's a bit of a nightmare as it always is in the boat, boats you know, when you're on your own, do you know what I mean? It's never easy. But in the end, uh, so cut a long story short, I, 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 I netted a big, big ball of weed. And it wasn't until I sort of netted the ball of weed and dropped the rod that I noticed like the fish was sort of in the net, but not quite. I had loads of, loads of weed. And I could just see the um, back, it sort of side onto me. So it's only quite a short mirror back. And I'm thinking, oh, sort of on one hand result, like it's in the net. But I'm thinking, oh, really? I had a bit of an anticlimax. So I really thought that was it. So. Um, but it's still not finished because it's, I couldn't lift the arms of the net up. So much weed on the, both arms and uh, so I'm pulling it all off. And the more I'm pulling off, the more it's, it's the weed around the fish is clearing and it's sort of spooked and bolted down into the bottom of the net. I get the net round it, so yes, so it's in the net and uh, tearing the weed out. And I've noticed a big set, I could see it was a big, uh, a good mirror. Um, 
I see some scales down on its wrist. I'm thinking, oh, that's another one that I'd caught this year, which was one of the other 18, which was a big fish, but I'm thinking, oh, you know, oh, it's not that one. So I'm still frantically pulling the weed like you do. And, uh, managed to get, get to the bottom of the neck cord, so, uh, the, the bottom of the net, so I could sort of spin it on its, uh, on its side, and then it was really deep, and I've gone, oh, wow. And I've had to do it again, and uh, it's definitely it. And I've just, uh, just gone into like a wreck, you know. It's just a really like, quite emotional and just had a little I, cry up. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's just. I remember when you rang me. I got, I got the phone call. I was fishing myself. But I woke up to your phone call, and I thought that's a little bit earlier than what I would normally expect him to ring me. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And I knew you'd have the phone to your head, so I thought I can answer this without him knowing I've answered it. So I answered the phone, and I just thought I'll listen just to see, just see if I can hear him. And I could hear your breathing straight away. As soon as I heard your breathing, I knew that you, I knew exactly what you was going to say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sure enough. Yeah, I mean, so then um, it was it, and I thought, no, I'm not going to give it a shout, like you know. And I did. I couldn't. I, could, I could, can't. You know, um, I'm not going to repeat exactly what I said, but um, there's a lot of motion there. Do you know what I mean? It was just a just a mega mega moment really for me. And, uh, so yeah, it was in the net, and then it was up the front of the, the boat, you know, the net. So I had to paddle backwards you know, in a little big boat, plastic boat with one oar and a, and a rod up the front through weed beds to the surface. So it took me about 20, 25 minutes. It was the longest 20 minutes of my life to get back to shore. And all the while, uh, you know, I'm thinking, you know, it's not, you could get out of the net yet. Do you know what I mean? All them stupid things going through your head. Um, but sure enough, I got to dry land, got the net propped up on the front of the swim and uh, there's another fish just there. Uh, yeah net propped up on the on the front of the, the swim and, and rung you up and rung Joe and uh, yeah incredible mate it's, uh, I mean it's only a couple of years it could have been like, you know it could have been five years if, it, if that's what it took and, and people do go five years fishing particular fish but for me that two years that still meant meant loads you know what I mean you, you know two years of solid dedication and when you were there when it when you were oh yeah there. oh for sure yeah and the things you've you, 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 you put off in pursuit of these fish, you know, the days off work, the amount of money you don't earn in the time that you, you should have been at work and the family things you should have gone on and the, and the times you don't see your girlfriend when, you know, and there's things going on and all your mates are going to a barbecue and you, you're at a pond, right you know. Down the lake, yeah. yeah, and the times when really you don't actually fancy going that week, but you've got to, you know, you've got to go and all those, all, all in that moment, you know, all come together and it was just, just it yeah, it was, mate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I said to we couldn't along. I said, just make sure you ring me when you can. Yeah, yeah. You don't ring me, I ain't gonna be Yeah, you, you was down within an hour. I'm like, glad you did. Yeah, yeah, no, it was, it was brilliant morning. Went up the cafe afterwards, didn't we? It was, uh, yeah, superb. I was, uh, I was buzzing for a couple of days. My, my missus was uh, in Norfolk um, with the kids and um, for a few days on holiday, so I shot straight up there and spent a few a couple of days with her, and that was yeah, it was perfect. Mate. It's really, really, really good, yeah. yeah. What, have you had one, have you, mate? You had a fish. <laughs> <laughs> well done, man. Cheers, mate. Oh, mega. Right, so game changer. The biggest game changer for me would be the incredibly deep Bundy's pit and actually figuring out how to use adjustable zigs effectively in 45, 50 foot of water. Um, Bundy's is well known. It's got an incredible stock of commons, some lovely, lovely fish, but been so deep, when it switches off, it switches off. And when I finally got my head around adjustable zigs and how to use them effectively, and I, I still think I was one of the early people to use them on there, it was a real eye-opener. It was a huge eye-opener. It turned blank sessions into three and four fish catch sessions. Not just the adjustable zigs and, and actually using the zigs, but the bait as well that we used. It all came about through obviously watching the water, using your eyes. You know, you're not getting bites on the bottom and you're seeing lots and lots of bubble activity and fish shows and bits and pieces. So it was obvious the fish were up in the water. You know, we all know they spend a lot of time off the bottom, probably more time off the bottom than they do anywhere near the bottom in fairness. Um, but the activity, the bubbles, the rolls, the shows said that they were, they were happy in the upper layers and it was about getting a bait in front of them in those upper layers. Initially, it was all a bit 
I mean, the kits were available, but when you've never used them, it, it was a little bit complicated, tangles were a problem. So it was a case of adjusting the system to suit and then putting your own little fixes in to make sure that you didn't get tangles and you could get the bait to the depth you wanted. Um, and once that came into play, it was a real, real eye-opener. And one of the first sessions when I really, really got to grips with it, I had one of the A-team at over £38. When it came to the adjustables, one of the biggest things I found was making sure that the hook link was the right length. Because you're not using the hook link to set the depth, anything over kind of five, six foot hook links would cause you issues on the cast and presenting the bait and popping it up off the float, etc. and that kind of thing. So of course, kind of keeping it down to sort of four foot hook links, and making sure that I always PVA'd the hook bait back above onto the boom of the adjustable kit prevented tangles and it meant that every single time once that PVA had dissolved my hook bait was up and then I could pop the float up to the depth that I needed it to be at or into the area I thought the fish would be at. And one thing I would say that, that there was a real game changer with the adjustable zigs for me was always starting in the middle third of the depths. That was the biggest thing that always seemed to work more often than not. Finally, foam we all know works on the zigs, but one of the biggest things I've, I found in those kind of depths and using the adjustables was using really, really buoyant 10 and 12 mil pop-ups. Didn't matter about flavour, it was all the same as with the foam, it was all about the colour. Um, whites, yellows were, were just immense as an hook bait on the zigs in those kind of depths. Tea or coffee? Coffee to start with, coffee for breakfast, then tea. Ground sheet or bareback? <laughs> bareback. Helicopters or lead clip? A bit of each, depending. Sharpened or unsharpened? Ah, you're, if you have to sharpen your hooks, you're useless. That's all I can say, yeah? Yeah, next. Washed out or fluoro? Oh, again, clarity dependent. Camo or olive? I like a bit of each. You know, I'm metrosexual, aren't I? Biscuits, dry or dunked? Oh, come on. Well, it depends on your biscuit, doesn't it? Um, we used to fish at Sutton, and if you bought council biscuits, they would right have the eight. Well, yeah, you had to buy like a, a, a nice boaster or something, and then you was accepted. Mirrors or commons? Mirrors. Big pit or intimate pond? All of them. Out the bag or boosted hook bait? Again, dependent. I like to, um, I've always been, you know, I, I tend to use not a lot of bait more singles and not a lot of bait, so I want them, more often than not, I've boosted them up in some way. What annoys you most when fishing? How, how long have you got, El? Um, well, what annoys me most when I'm fishing? I don't know, I'm, I'm, pre I'm a different chap these days. I, I'm like much calmer, so not a lot. Dog shit, I hate dog shit with a passion. I'm fox piss, I hate foxes pissing on my kit. Like, more than anything. Yeah, go on. Spod or spom? Uh, spom. Spods are for joeys, obviously. Favourite meal whilst fishing? Ah, Favourite meal when fishing? Whatever. I'm the world's worst. I'm the, I've got the worst diet in the world. So whatever I've brought with me would be my favourite thing. <laughs> Mono, braid or fluoro? Uh, every, every, every one of them's got its place. Ridge monkey or frying pan? Frying pan, a ridge monkey is two frying pans. Like, you only need one frying pan. Uh, or a frying pan and a metal plate and it's an oven. So yeah, frying pan. Favourite season of the year? Spring. Beaked or straight point? Again, dependent. You know, if it's, uh, if I'm fishing with bottom baits and stuff, definitely a beak point. Uh, depending on whether it's gonna get rolled around by other stuff. But yeah, each, dependent, again. Long range or in the edge? Uh, again, you gotta be a jack of all trades in this game, mush. Cult classics or modern tech? Uh, again, I'm, you know, I'm not, um, I look forward and back. Slack or tight lines? Slack, we're not going to get away with it. But, you know, in the sort of fishing we've been doing or trying to do this trip, um, I like to ping them out there and fish almost quiver tip style. Dance or trance? Trance, mush. Head torch, red or white beam? <sighs> white. Favourite hook bait? I like a bit, again, I like, everything's got its place, Al. I like a boily for most of the time, um, but I also like a peanut or a tiger nut. Pop-ups or bottom baits? Again, totally dependent on the, uh, on the lake bed. Boots or trainers? Yeah, see, I'm, I mean, look, come on. Everything's got its place, I guess, but I like a nice pair of shoes because I'm an adult these days. Coated or supple braid? 
Yeah, just, you know, again, it, all my fishing is normally about ease and laziness. So coated, don't tangle as much. So it's always going to be a coated braid for me. Self takes or pass a buyer? Um, these days, self takes because I have been disappointed more times than you've had hot dinners. Buzz bars or single sticks? Uh, again, each has got its place. More often than not, singles. Brolly or Bivy? Brolly. UK 50 or world record? Neither. Really turns me on. Blonde sauce pot, nightclub, champagne, hotel. That sounds a bit more me. Won't Favourite joke. carp, dead or alive? Oh, Jesus, come on. It's not the easiest of questions, Elliot. Um, there's been millions, millions and millions and millions and millions. And I couldn't name one without offending another one. So there's been loads, mate. Loads and loads and loads. Loads that I wish I'd fished for and had the opportunity to fish for mind and didn't. Um, hindsight is a wonderful thing in life. Um, and yeah, turning the clock back, would I, would I fish for a lot of fish I didn't fish for and catch? Yeah, of course I would. But at the time, there's always something more important going on. It's okay, first. go on, you can go through. The dog can go through. Don't worry about me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you missed what little sod. <laughs> Didn't even say hello to me. <laughs> aloof. <laughs> Typical woman, that like, aloof. <laughs> Boilies or particles? Yeah, again, absolutely. All these things are all venues dependent, I guess. Day dependent, hour dependent. Like, I, I can change, a, I take everything with me. I'm not one of these people that has a car full, you know, I'll have a bag of bait, I might have a few nuts and I might have a tin of corn in the car, but I've got all the bases covered, more or less, you know. Zig fishing or floater fishing? Oh, zig fishing is like boring floater fishing. Floater fishing is like my perch, you know, it's a one rod discipline, it's an art, and it's like trotting a stick float. It's, a, it's something you need to learn and appreciate and evolve. Um, so I would have to say floater fishing. Compact digital or SLR? SLR. Facebook or Instagram? Both of them absolutely leave me feeling f***ing <laughs> sick. But they're a means to an end for my work and I like to see my friends doing well and what they're catching and their lives. So, you know, I have a love and hate relationship with both of them. Raps or yards? <laughs> Sorry? Sorry, what was that ute did you say to me? Yards, obviously. You have to choose one, Mary or Black Mirror. Both would have been nice, mate. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't distinguish between the two. Both at the time were, had, had, a, had, a, had a magic about them. Not all, car, not all big carp have got a magic about them, but both of them for whatever reason did. So I, can't, I couldn't really draw a line between the two. I think the pl for, for the fishing, for the actual fishing and the fact that we weren't allowed to be there, I was probably the Black Mirror edges it because it was a bit clandestine and we shouldn't have been doing it. And you lost it. Fishing or misses? Sorry? Fishing or misses? Duh. <laughs> Stupid question. Next. That's the last one. Ah. Oh. Because obviously it was going to be fishing, wasn't it? Jesus. Fishing or misses? I'm getting new misses every week. I can't get new fishing every week. That's why I should have answered it, shouldn't I? The one that got away, uh, we've all got these moments of heartache, which can be utterly crucifying when they happen. We all know how much they hurt. And when it's a target fish that you've been after for a period of time, it hurts even more. But this particular one hurt ultimately because it was a target fish, but also because I knew I couldn't get back in the saddle and do it all over again. So this goes back to Linear Manor Farm in about 1999. And... Um, Fished there hard that year, fished there hard 98, 98 99. In, in 99 in particular, I'd started to get to grips with it and I caught most of, the, uh, most of the fish in there, not just the big ones. And I was fishing weekends only on what was, what was then probably the busiest and best known day ticket carp water in the country, or certainly one of them. I think it had about 15 or so 30s, which put it 
right out there with two carp being over 40 pounds and 1530s there were very 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 few places that could touch it and as a result it received enormous pressure from anglers coming from all the way up north people like Frank Warwick and, and people like Terry and so on and from all over the place it attracted these anglers so it was very busy and you were up against it in terms of difficult difficult fishing and and trying to deal with the catching of these these quite tricky carp I remember early that year I'd found and buried the most famous fish in the lake which was called Popeye with a lot of regret because obviously then I knew that that was one I wasn't going to be able to catch but the biggest mirror in the lake was called Cuttail a famous fish that was around for years and years and gradually I worked my way towards her caught, caught the, the long head fish and the random linear and the perfect linear and various others as as, as I went along just fishing either one overnight or in the week going to work again in the morning or getting down on a Friday night and fishing till Sunday so you know real world carp fishing caught a lot of fish through that summer on floaters and I, I remember at the time that, that I had caught more on uh, even though I'd had limited time it was just going my way and I had caught more than anybody else and you always feel that you're, you're getting towards your destiny, your goal, when you're catching that many fish. And, and you try and you, you're fueled. The more you catch, the more you want to catch, and the more you want to fish and try and keep those wheels oiled and keep moving forward towards your ultimate goal. And so I was properly on it that year, really, really on it. And using a lot of personal time on my holiday and so on and so forth. And as I said, I was catching quite a lot of fish through the height of the summer off the top. I was also getting them on those uh, mini high betaine pellets on the bottom mixed with hemp. That was a very good tactic that year with a single tiger nut over the top. But um, the floater fishing campaign was, was deadly. We, we, uh, we applied tiny floating trout pellets to, to the lake that my mate Mark had, uh, my best mate Mark had discovered a year or two previously. And we'd been on a bit of a um, a run around the linear complex and other lakes just vanquishing them these pellets were so effective and when you bear in mind that back then everybody was using chum mixers to be using these tiny floating pellets was an utter and complete game changer probably the biggest game changer I've ever seen in my fishing life actually and we were the only ones on it it, it was just devastating and uh, so we caught a lot of fish from Manor um, Mark wasn't fishing manor too often but um, I continued on, on my march to what I thought was an inevitable conclusion which was the capture of cuttail and having caught just about all the others it was the scene was set perfectly for, for the finale sure enough one hot afternoon in August I hooked cuttail on a little size 10 super specialist had her on for about 20 minutes and um, you already know what, what's going to happen because of the name of this piece, but I <laughs> played this fish in. I've, I've kicked my trainers off, jumped in the lake, which was always horrible at, at Linear Manor because whatever lived in the silt ate you alive. Man, the weeping welts we used to get from the stuff in the silt there. But kicked my trainers off, jumped in the lake, pushed the nail, I can see what I've got on. I've got my soft floater rod, fully compressed, eight pound double strength, little controller and it's coming in I can see what it is and it's coming in and three foot or so off the neck cord the um the little tiny hook popped out and she just sort of sort of sat there for a minute like this and then just went and swam off just woke up and I just it crushed me really really crushed me um on two levels one that I'd lost what would have been then uh would have been my first 40 pounder. She was about 42 pounds then, I think. But it also crushed me because I knew that I wasn't gonna do it all again. I wasn't gonna go back there doing the overnighters and catch, I'd had to catch the whole stock to get to her and it was a mountain to climb on limited time. And I, and I, I realized I wasn't gonna do it all over again. And, um, and then pretty much uh, walked away from Manor and left there and then and it's the only fish to, 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 day, to, to date that's actually brought tears to my eyes as I realise that some fish just aren't meant to end up in your net and uh, you can't always be victorious.
Right, I'm going to start this piece by apologising for the noise of the planes. We're in Raysbury, so we're right near the airport and we're at a lovely little lake. It's Angling Projects and it's run by Les Weber. He started this place many, many years ago. He's got some excellent stories, which we'll get into later. But I'm here with the person I like to call the people's champ. He's someone I met over 10 years ago and he just started at Nash. He gave me my first ever tackle deal and uh, like I say, he just took over at Nash. I remember thinking at the time, he's very young to be doing this. And uh, I'll be totally honest, I didn't expect to see him here now, but he is and that man is Alan Blair. I love him, everyone loves him. He's so enthusiastic with his fishing and I'm out with him for the next 24 hours. And I just said to him, we'll do whatever you want to do. You know, I'm not going to tell you where we got to go, anything like that, you decide and we'll do that. So this is where we're starting. We're going to go to a host of different venues, hopefully catch some carp. Plane's just arriving. So uh, I've let Alan get off. He's on the far bank sorting his stuff out. And I'm going to do the same now. Right, well it hasn't taken him long, probably 15 minutes or so and he's got his first one on. Morning. Morning. It's all common, is it? Yeah. Yeah. It weeded him up quite bad, but a uh, bit of persistence. He's got it out of the weed and, well, it's pretty close to the bank now. Yes. Oh, he's in, he's half in. <laughs> He's in. Lovely to see you, mate. Good work. You're right. Good work. Yes, he'll do. Go on, I've got the net. Well, we've had trains, planes and automobiles coming past, but uh, we couldn't have asked for a better start than this. I was stood over there watching Alan, he was pinging mixers out, and he said to me this morning that uh, they were all mostly they fish on the bottom. They had been ripping the bottom <laughs> to pieces, coloured up, but I couldn't help myself. There was just the odd one or two milling about, and sure enough, just love floating <laughs> fishing geese. But yeah, so he's caught one. I definitely want to catch one, because that's a really cool carp. Absolutely. They're all just as nice. So, uh, well done it. on your first fish. Big ups, bro, I'm thank try you. Sweet. Right, good start. As you may have noticed, Alan's had a little move up, and by the looks of it, it's because there's quite a few fish out here, mate. There's a few more here, mate. They were over there in the weed. Obviously, a bit of disturbance playing that last one in. He's kind of pushed them over this way. And this is where I sort of saw him this morning, Elliot. It was just totally different colour, lots of fizzing and sheeting. And yeah, that's clear quietened signs. down a lot now, and they've actually come up cautiously on the surface. Yeah, so. you've got your, your wishes come true then? Kind of, like, still not great <laughs> conditions for it, but yeah. He, looked, he literally looked gutted this morning and thought he might have to fish on the bottom, but uh, despite the cloud, they're taking them. There's quite a few fish out there and he's got them feeding, so uh, we'll see what happens. I might have a little tr trundle around the other side still, mate, have a little look. Don't want to cramp your style too much in here. Yeah. Um, see if I can get a couple feeding. If not, I'll definitely cramp your style in here and uh, pass off the <laughs> well, back you'd here. be more than welcome. You'd be more than welcome. 
Yeah, that's so plenty of space. That's the plan. Um, and we, like I, like I said this morning, we've got we've got a busy 24 hours ahead of us. You're yeah. gonna take us all over the place, aren't you? Yeah, you know, when you rung me and said you fancy going out for a day's fishing, it's a little bit different with me, Elliot. Like a lot of people, a lot of lads at work and friends, they won't come with me no more because it's just too intense and too much yeah. moving and, and new places. But it's like what I like doing. Yes. You know, I don't like sitting still for too long, become restless and bored. Yep. And yeah, I want to take you and show you a few little haunts. Um, potentially not fishing for massive fish, but fishing yep. for nice fish in inter interesting locations. Bit of river fishing, bit of canal fishing, bit of tidal river fishing. I've never caught, I've, I've never caught a carp off the river. Oh, so mate. if I could catch one with you today, that would be that. Or the next you 24 hours, that. that'd be lovely. That would, yeah. Brilliant. Never caught one. Tried a couple of times, um, but yeah, not done it. So to catch catch a carp up the river for me would be really cool. Well, so, let's make that our absolute yeah. target. Okay, then. that's the aim. So there yeah. you go. That's the aim is to catch me my first river carp. But for now. <laughs> I'll try and catch one out of it. Been around here a little while now, and it's not looking great. It's just started to rain. But we're putting a few mixers out, seeing the odd fish come up. Like literally, I saw one, and I stood here for at least ten minutes, probably waiting for him to take another one. He didn't. Walked back around the other side, and he's took another one. Um, so I've come back around, put some more bait out, and by the looks of it, there's a chance here because it's just taken another mixer. So I don't think there's a lot of fish here feeding, but there's definitely one and one is enough. Well, I've got my hook bait on. I'm going to free line for these. You're also about to watch me tie a PVA bag in the rain. So because I'm free lining, you know, it's just a hook and a mixer, so there's almost no weight there at all. So I'm just going to nick a very small PVA bag on, and that'll help me get the weight to get out to where the fish are. They're only a short distance out, so this will be plenty. There we go. Nothing spectacular, nothing revolutionary, just a bag of mixers. Snip that off, get the PVA away. And then, just gonna gently hook that on there. Simple as that, and you'll see I've got a little yellow sight bob on there, which makes it easier to pick my hook bait out amongst the rest. Rain's making it really hard. Might have to put a float on.
No ale jsme jiné. Hope it's come off, innit? For <laughs> sake. Ah. Well, it looked really good here to start with. There's quite a few fish taken, and now it's sort of just this one out here. I've been trying at him, but you put a cast anywhere near him, he stops. The wind's drifting through. It's literally he's bobbing up random places he's not sort of stopping in an area and taking them he just pops up here and there and when it's like that you can spend a lot of time wasting time you know on the surface don't get me don't get me wrong if if you gave me a thousand pounds to catch one out of here off the top i would stay and try and catch that one fish but you know i want to catch one out the river um so i'm gonna have a go and have a word about it and see what he thinks but you know we get more and more rain and it just looks like our best option is going to be to have a move. So I'll go and talk to Al, see what he's saying, but um, I'm not really feeling it anymore. Well, it's time to make a move. Although there's a bit of a break in the weather now, it's been pretty dreadful here for the last hour. Lots of drizzly rain and it's actually got quite cold. So get on the road, head off down to the canal and uh, yeah, have a wander along the Grand Union, see if we can see any fish, drop onto a few likely looking areas and just give it a couple of hours uh, before heading back into Essex this evening, do a proper bit of river fishing. I can't believe it's taken me so long to come down and visit Les at his amazing fishery. Yeah, known him for a good number of years now. He puts so much back into angling. So yeah, the lake's amazing. Beautiful fish, great surroundings. Pretty much in the hub of carp fishing. You know, you've got Raysbury on one side, the Horton Complex on the other side. And yeah, he's done an amazing job down here. There's currently 15 kids. They've come along for a day's angling. But yeah, he's got some great facilities, everything from showers, toilets, kitchen, uh, restaurant type area. The kids can stay here should they wish. Yeah, really special, um, special setup and, and fair play to him to devote in the best part of 40 years of his life to, to such a great cause. I know I'm going to come back and bring some of the other lads back with me and definitely spend a bit of time up here helping Les with the kids. Ready? As I'll ever be. Let's do As this. I'll ever be. Let's so, where this. exactly are we? So, this is Grand Union Canal. Yeah. Have you fished it before? Never. No. no. Um, yeah, it's one of the, the, the biggest canal systems in the country. I've heard of it, yeah. And it's full of carp to a degree. Yeah. Um, came up here at the weekend canoeing. It's my brother's 30th and found loads out, loads. And it was different conditions to this. Bright yeah, sunshine. Hot and sunny. They're all up on the surface. and. But, you know, give it a go. It's worth yeah, yeah, got to be there still, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure, mate. Well, as you can see from uh, Alan's van, he's properly kitted out and ready for this uh, rip and dip style fishing, as rip I like to call it. Dip. <laughs> um, yeah, we're not going to be here very long, I don't think, are we? What? Nah, an hour I'll get and a bit, bored, maybe. Bruv. Yeah, like, he gets I really too bored. Do. So. Like, I want to <laughs> see new things, new places, yeah. try and catch one. You know, if you can't catch one here, 
in half hour, 45 minutes, you've got your location wrong. Yeah. They ain't so here, so kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, a little so, right pop-up. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Well, well, that's the plan then. So we'll, we'll start here and uh, no doubt before long, end up somewhere totally different. <laughs> I love it. That is cool. Whose idea was all that then? Was that yours? Was that Nashi's? Was it Nashi's? Was it? Yeah. reached the destination. This is where Alan saw him at the weekend, and uh, it appears they're still here, mate. Yeah, a little bit surprised to be fair, but it is shallow. Um, just before you got here, I come up, put half a dozen slices out. Can't see a lot of that bread now. I'm not suggesting they have eaten it all, but uh, at least it's fish in the area. Yeah. yeah, there's fish mooching about. Um, yeah, I was a little bit late. I got. Um, <laughs> Got lost trying to find a petrol station. Did you get sorted though? Yeah, I got it Sorry. done. But the uh, sat nav took me to a place where there was a petrol station that didn't exist, which was ideal. Um, Good so yeah, I was a bit, I was a bit later than Alan arriving, but there's fish here. We've just seen one over here, one over here, and I'm sure there's more. The water's quite, quite it's murky, quite unusual. So. Like, firstly, to find somewhere that widens out so much. Um, but more so to find this much weed growth. I like, yeah, you I was don't surprised see to see this the much weed, weed really. Um, Plus, you've got the big overhangs here and some decent overhangs yeah. there, so it's, it's, it's a natural every reason magnet. to be here. Yeah, they, have, yeah. like, they have. Well, look, we uh, 60 said minutes. About an hour, so let's, 60 roll. Minutes. let's roll. Let's get the gear sorted. Well, just going to flick a couple of choddies out, dead simple. I know they're going to be fishing. Quite a lot of weed in the area, plus it's going to be dead silty out there. Um, loads of silt build up over the years. Um, you've got a big set of overhangs here, brambles and stuff. I'm going to position one along that and then one a bit tighter into this sort of corrugated steel. Um, when we arrived, there's a sort of overflow there. It was trickling some water out. Yeah, it looks good. It looks the sort of place if I was a carp in the canal, I'd be hanging out right about now. We have to call you uh, Alan Impatient Blair, aren't we? Sorry, guys, they <laughs> hate filming with me, mate. Yes. <laughs> Look at him, go on. In you go. He's in. Yes. Hi, bye. He's, he's in good nick. Just getting busted up <laughs> by the boat. Oh, bless him, man. I feel sorry for him. No one wants to be getting churned up by a boat, do they? How about that? For a very cool little carp. Nice quick bite. Yeah, man, look at the character of him. Big old rubbery lips, tail falling apart. He's got a little dent in the top of his yeah. head there. 
few stories to tell, I reckon. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Look at them lips. Yeah, he's a, he's a very cool little dude. Yeah, I like him. And I want to catch one. <laughs> it. Honestly, I haven't even, both fish he's caught, I haven't even got rods out of the sleeve. It's just like you turn around, he's like, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, very well done. I'm going to try and get my, myself one too. One thing that's really important to me, as it should be for everybody, is fish care. And I always carry a product called Propolis. It's a, it's a fish care treatment, you know, you put it on them and it does them good. I want to use the absolute best I can to ensure the fish is in good nick. And a lot of fish I've seen my friends catch from these sort of rivers, canals, got a lot of damage. And I think we owe it to them just to treat them right. So, you know, carry some carp care kit. Even if you can't get a good one, you carry some, you know, treat them up and put them back with their wounds treated and hopefully uh, the old carp gods will shine down on you and pay you back for it. Well, if you're anything like me uh, you haven't, and you haven't got much experience on the canals or the rivers, there's probably all sorts of questions that you would ask yourself if you were to turn up to one like I have today. So the first things to me, mate, that have, you know, immediately within 20 minutes I've noticed that I've sort of got wrong. Uh, first one is that I brought with me quite big leads because I thought, oh, it'd be a bit of flow. Turns out there's no flow on a canal. Bit of uh, tow. When yeah, they look, open the yeah, lock gates the and stuff and the boat's moving, yeah. you get a bit of undertow and stuff. But. So what? So um, as far as holding bottom goes and that, in the canals, it's not so bad. It's not like, you don't get the issues like you would on a, a river. You it's have not to a have raging the best, torrent of a river. Yeah. So that's the difference, main difference between canal and river is yeah, flow no versus... Yeah, no big flow, yes. so to speak. Okay, and the second one, uh, almost got wiped out by a boat. So <laughs> you no did, back bro. leads. You were like, back leads on, back leads on. I was scrambling around and a boat, well, to be fair, I thought I was, I was lucky. Was I lucky there? Because no, I didn't I have them so, back mate. Little, you, 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 Yeah, but you're fishing braids, decent braids, so you managed to get it down, get down. To, to a point, but I think it's pretty fundamental that, you know, if you're going to fish on the canal, you do use back leads. Um, they come down the sort of centre track. Um, you know, I'm not trying to teach you to suck eggs out, but you've got a, a marginal shelf, and then it drops into the sort of the boat track, the boat and then back almost. onto another marginal yeah. shelf. And yeah, you kind of want to pin it down I'll often use two, I'll sort of position my rig onto the far margin, slide a back lead right across to get it at the bottom of this shelf here, and then drop another one at the bottom of the near ah, shelf okay. and just yeah, sort of yeah, pin yeah. it so it's properly like that. Yeah, way, just because if they go through quite fast or it might be a little bit shallower, the prop spinning and stuff, it can try and pick your line yes, up. Yes, and, and that is bad news. I've seen I've, many people yeah. get wiped out. <laughs> I've from. always wanted to see it. I, I've never seen it, but I've always wanted to. Okay, so, and what other, you know, what there must be loads of, you know, the path we're sort of sat on here. Yeah, you know, it's, they are, it's a, it's, a, it's a piece of waterway that's, you know, it's a navigation. Boats are going up and down it all day long. Okay, today it's quite quiet, uh, the weather's not great, but it can be very busy. You can see one every sort of three or four minutes. Yeah. Um, you've got the towpath, people are using it. Cyclists, families out for a walk, dog walkers. Um, so you, you have to be sort of considerate, mate. You know, a bit yeah. like the park lake fishing, the canal fishing is exactly the same. You've got to be really conscious of, of everyone else around you. There's offices over here. Um, yeah, if we were to do the lunch, night, you know, yeah, you just got to be considerate. You know, like any fishing, be considerate. Yeah, like having a swim with uh, people walking through it all day, you can't, you can't leave your stuff. You can't sort laying of around. Like around. Like I'm now <laughs> across the park. Nah. I'll get my legs run over. But they're really interesting places. Um, yeah, what is it that you I love fishing? about yeah, Why do I fish them? Because have you seen another angler? No, I haven't actually. No, no, <laughs> I know, would have that uh, and, and yeah, if we'd have gone to a uh, club water or a syndicate, more often than not, you can get pinned into an area you can't move, you haven't got the flexibility to fish how you want to. And the reason I fish these types of venues is because I can do my thing. You know, I can yeah, do my what, thing now. In, in this instance here, there's been no pre-baiting, but if I was going to invest a bit of time on a stretch, I could come down, I could get some bait going in, I could get the fish visiting the spot, knowing almost certainly that no one else is going to be fishing over the top of me. Um, more often than not, you're fishing for the unknown. 
But to counteract that, you know, I'm not fishing for monsters. No. You've caught some mega fish, Al, yeah, and yeah. you know, the boys that are on these, these syndicates and stuff, they're fishing for far more prestigious fish than these bigger fish. But I like it, yes, you know, that, yeah, little, yeah, yeah. that, that yeah. little common, he was tired, mate. Yeah. He's, he was done the, he's done the rounds, yeah. mate. He yeah, could yeah, have been yeah. to Aylesbury and to Tring and who knows where he's been or come from or where he's going to go to next. And I, I really like that. Each fish, you look at it and you're like, yeah, you are cool, yeah, it's man. Definitely, like, it's quite a thought. Like, I've done uh, I've done some trips abroad, like obviously filming and stuff. And like, the canals, like a big lake, it doesn't really bother me. Like, it, you know, I've not fished loads of massive lakes, but if you chuck me on 150 acres of water, yeah. it won't, it won't it will not bother me. Yeah. No, it doesn't. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't yeah, yeah. But I can stand there and I can see 80 acres at Look once. across like, it. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, break it up into a million channels and that, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah. But the thing with the canals, you know, the ones I've been to in Europe and that, is like you can walk a really long way yeah. and you don't see anything. You can see the bottom sometimes, or sometimes you can't, but you go so far for so little. And that to me is, is if I was ever going to fish a canal or a river, with the attitude I have towards fishing, i.e. I like to target a fish, or I would have to know they're locked within a stretch. But yeah. I guess to but, you, but the I fun of it is yeah. that they maybe aren't, and they're going to... It is no different, though. You know, fishing's fishing, and the most important thing in, in any form of angling is make sure you're fishing where there's fish. You mm. know, it's yes. fundamental. Um, so just like sitting and watching 100 acres of water for days on end, observing where they show in jumping, I'm doing exactly the same on the canal, just slightly more mobile. On the bicycle. I'm walking a lot on the bicycle. Yeah. You know, whenever I'm, I'm over in Europe, and you'll know it firsthand, so many of the canal systems over there you can drive along. Yes. So they simply drop yeah, the window, arm along. out the yeah, window, yeah, yeah. and you're just looking. And the one thing I've learned over sort of 15 years of really putting time into various different canals and rivers right across Europe is find a fish, not don't fish where you think they're going to be. Like, I will never, like, if you look along here, there's bare, nice overhangs and trees and stuff. Um, to the angler, you'd be like, that looks amazing. That looks like the... Per and sometimes they're not in those places. Yeah, they're there. in the barren, the places that, as an angler, you would just walk past and ignore. But for some reason, it might be a bloodworm bed, mussels. It might be deeper. It might be shallower. But something, they want to be there. That's yeah, the yeah, place yeah. they're yeah. happy being. And, and if I'm going to invest time on a particular stretch of river or canal, invest the time looking and searching. You're not looking for swimming fish, passing fish. You're looking for fish that are chilling in an area. Holding in an Holding areas. in an area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, best scenario. They're feeding in that yeah. area. But, and then I leave them. And then I go back days later, a week later, whatever. And I, I'm hoping they're there again. Yeah. And then again and again and again, maybe four or five times, I'm wanting to see them in that area. Once you've cracked that, mate, you've cracked it because... You know, we had the fish out on the mat. The stuff coming out of it is, is back end and that, and it's shells and stuff. Not nice boilies. No, 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 nah, no, not no, like they're no. having to rummage around yes, for, yeah, yeah. for the bits. So you there'll know, be areas they visit. So on if you can find like, those areas where yeah. they're happy being, and then you can give them some nice food, oh, it is quite easy fishing. It's easy fishing. Yeah, yes, mate. Yes, you know, it's yes. just tracking them down in the first place. And you know, this particular case in point, this canal goes for miles and miles. It was only because I was out on a, on a canoe at the weekend that I saw the fish held up here. Otherwise. Would I pick this little bit here? As a carp angler, probably not. Probably not. No. Because it's much better Yeah, the trees and that. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, but it was yeah. just because they were happy being here. And the same, where we go and fish on the river tonight, it's a really long stretch from lock to lock, really long. And, you know, when we get from the car to, to where we're going, we will walk past so many areas, you'll be like, that looks Let's have a go sick, here. Let's that looks yeah, sick. Yeah. But we're going to an area that's it's a lot deeper than everyone else, everywhere else. There's a lot more weed there. And for the best part of six years now, that's been those fish's home. That, so, is, yeah, their you know that keep, is their yeah, home, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah. I always look at it, you know, when I'm fishing a lake or anywhere like that, imagine your house at home, there's areas of your house where you're going to spend a huge amount of time and other areas where you spend very little time. You might not go in the garden very much or the garage yeah. or the hallway or the toilet, but you are often sitting in the living room yeah, or yeah, laying yeah, in yeah. bed sleeping. In the garage or in bed, generally, just, for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You've got to crack those areas. So, you know, this stretch here, you're just trying to break it up into where do they want to be all the time and where don't they like yes. it. And that all comes with effort, isn't it? For sure. With the rivers, the yeah. canals. For sure. The effort is... is undoubtedly going to be the key, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And then it's pretty simple. You know, it's silty bottoms, choose your rig accordingly. Yeah. Bait choice, not a what massive. About, what about pre-baiting? Because, you know, pre -baiting uh, that is, to me, key, that, mate. Like, as a, yeah, it's like an outside angler looking in and the people are, you know, I know people that fish rivers. I know so many anglers. I know, I know people that do fish rivers and that's always been, one, a very good way to catch loads of bream. Yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> but yeah. a very good way 
to, to ensure that as the cart pass those areas, yeah. they, they, know they stop food. every time because yeah. there's yeah. food there. People often, you know, certainly people like us, we've worked in the trade for a little while now, they straight away make the judgment, oh yeah, but you get loads of free bait, you can afford to throw it in, but I never pre bait a lot. Yeah. You know, it's not a case of me going up there once a week and dumping 10 kilos in, yeah. it's that little and often, little and yeah, often, yeah, little yeah. and often. And, you know, you can take a kilo of boilies, pre bait them with a kilo of boilies, that could last it's gone a in week. six hours, can't it, as well? Like it, a kilo, it, but at yeah. the same time, it could be gone in. But I'll often, you know, no difference to a lake. Find where the carp want to be, watch them, observe them, where do they really like to be within that area, and then go and clean the areas out with a rake, you know, a hand rake or, or, or a throwing it in rake. Um, and then bait over the top of the spots with gear, particle, ground yeah. bait, pellets, maggots, anything to bring all the little fish in to really polish the spot off. Yeah. But then after that, nothing goes in other than straight boilies because of the bream. Because of the bream. and the chub. Okay, so in a nutshell, choose your canal, choose your river, find your fish, make sure the areas are clean, fishable, start baiting them. But don't need loads. Yep, not necessarily Little loads, but them. then start fishing them, yep. stay off the towpath and uh, reap the rewards. Absolutely, mate. They're, it's out there for the taking. Yeah. So many river and canal systems that are quiet and unfished. Everyone's got an opportunity to go and, you know, have a do go. their own little thing, have their own little adventure. Yeah. Well, if you haven't learned anything from that, I'll be quite surprised because I've, you know, I've just took a hell of a lot of information from sitting with Alan for five minutes, you know, talking to someone who actually knows what they're on about. It's really valuable, no matter what sort of fishing you're going to do. If you can find someone that does actually know what they're on about, they actually go out and do it, you're going to learn something and uh, hopefully you just have. Alan's disappeared again. <laughs> he was he was making the tea, he was literally, he was right there, just sat on the ground, the kettle's on, the kettle's now boiled, Alan's gone. And I don't actually know where he's gone. <laughs> he's only been about, I don't know when I last saw him, 30 seconds. I'm guessing he's gone this way, because that's a long path and he's not up there. So I'm minding the rods and uh, no doubt in a minute I'm gonna hear, L, L, get the net. And he's probably got another one on, um, but yeah. He's gone. I don't know where he's gone. I don't know where he's gone. Well, I've had to disappear, even though I've just stuck the kettle on and offered the lads another drink. Um, yeah, pressure seems to have changed and I took a little wander down here and found two fish just mooching around on this far bank. Um, they seem quite content eating into the bank. Don't know what's down there, but I pinged a little bit of bread over. You never know. He's just moved up here. He's heading back in towards the brambles now. So yeah, the fishing's dead simple. Um, I'm not casting out and waiting for the carp to come to me. I'm wandering along looking for the fish. Got a really short, short rod and I'm fishing straight through to the hook with a piece of bread. Um, the fish are very receptive to bread. They're living in and around human beings, getting fed off the canal boats and stuff. Um, the office is there, people are gonna throw a bit of their lunch over. So yeah, they know exactly what uh, a piece of that is, it's just a case of getting it as tight to that far bank as possible, as discreetly as possible, and maybe catching another fish or two. Hiya. Well, as I said, it's all about sort of staying mobile, wandering around, looking for the fish. And I've just seen some disturbance underneath this bush here. There's a chance it could be a moorhen or a coot, but there's also a very good chance it could be a carp. And uh, I've managed to ping the bread across there. It's actually gone through. You'll notice I can just bounce it there. It's gone through a little bit of a, a vine and stuff. Um, absolutely no problem. If I do hook one, it'll rip straight out. Uh, and making casts like that are really, really useful someone's opened the lock gate it's towing through quite fast now and if i cast just a piece of bread on the surface of the water it would very very quickly move out of the vicinity of where the fish are, are happy being so to be able to sort of cast it through a, through a bit of branch or a twig or something and just suspend it out there 
it, it, it's often the way to get the bites. All I'm looking for is sort of ripples coming off the far bank. Bread, it can be so devastating. Of course on park lakes, but, but also on the canals. Uh, these fish, they absolutely know what white food is. Bread, uh, croissants, French stick, basically anything that's potentially gone stale on a canal boat and, and just been hoofed over the edge. And they're used to coming across it. Um, taking that, for sure it makes sense to you know, use a similar sort of bait coloration if you're fishing down on the bottom with your pop-ups or your boilies, um, just because they make that association of, of the colour white with, with food. Here he is. What are you saying? Where you been? Just having a little look. Any, anything? There was a couple of possible opportunities. One fish got his face right in the edge, yeah. milling around on the bottom. Tried getting the bread close to him, but blew my chances. And then there was the other odd fish. Um, yeah. Nothing amazing. Nothing it's been comes quiet fruition. here, mate. I've, I haven't seen. I haven't seen anything. <laughs> I haven't seen well, anything for a while, to be fair. I can safely say this has been the longest hour on the canal ever. Well, I think you we've did been here a couple away. of hours yeah. now. Yeah, I know, I know, mate. I can help myself. Let's roll then, let's, let's bounce, let's go somewhere else. Yeah, Sorry, let's mate. move. Uh, yeah. We're going to get stuck on the M25 as it is, so let's head back into Essex yeah. and go and do the night on river a, a proper river, bit of river. Yeah, yeah. cool. All right, sweet. Pack, Pack up. up. As you can tell, it's no longer the daytime. It's got dark, as always, got absolutely savaged by the M25. Hate to think how many times that thing has ruined my life over the years, traveling back to Essex, but um, it's done it again, as we expected. Uh, should have got out of the, should have left the canal earlier, but it's one of them things, uh, a lot of traffic that we kind of hoped wouldn't be there, and it was. So I managed to find Alan, couldn't find, there's no service around the river, so luckily I know the area, I only live 20 minutes away from here, so I uh, spent a little while looking around, managed to find him pulled up in this lay-by, and he's obviously somewhere through there, so I'm going to get my gear out, go find him, and get the rods out in the dark for the night. Not the best start to catching my first river carp, but that's how it goes. lovely night on the river. Turning up last night in the dark obviously wasn't the most ideal situation really, you know, we really wanted to get down here before that happened, but that's how it goes. Luckily, Alan knows this stretch really well, so I had a little word with him. He basically said that the middle of the river is deeper and weedier, and then the, the sort of margins either side are a bit clearer, nice gravel. So I spent a little time leading around, didn't want to go too mad, you know, so I it's only a thin little river. I get quite scared of spooking them, you know. There was a bloke next door to me as well, and uh, you know, I didn't want to ruin his chances. So I had a little lead around, um, and it was quite weedy to be fair. Weedy than I thought, but I come closer and closer basically until I could get clean gravel every single time. You know, I wanted to make sure my rigs were fishing, you know. So um, yeah, a few casts, not too many, but enough to guarantee my presentation, and uh, a few handfuls of bait over the top. That was that, you know. I had my rigs both in short along this margin. Didn't want lines going out across the river necessarily, so yeah, held them short and 
I wasn't overly confident, I must admit, but you know, they went out sweet and uh, unfortunately I caught a bream. Classic sort of uh, two or three bleeps in the night. I thought, oh no, don't even be a bream. Another couple of bleeps a little while later. I kept trying to uh, sleep it off really, hoping he would just fall off, but yeah, in the end, I had to go and sort him out. He was a nice bream actually, probably about four pound. Nice bronze bream, but not what I was after last night. And uh, I'm sure anyone that fishes these rivers is constantly plagued by them, so I feel your pain. But yeah, lovely night last night, really quiet. We had a Chinese, it was, uh, yeah, it was nice. I've had a lot of fun. Yeah, so last night was pretty sweet. Um, managed three chub, decent fish, around four pound. Uh, one big bream, and a lot of people would be quite negative about that, but I see it as a, uh, as a bit of a bonus, you know. I had to get up, yeah. But I know the spots are working, I know the rigs are working. Um, on that subject, I went really big as well, like massive, great 24 mil baits with a, with a great big cultured coating on the outside, and still they were getting snaffled by the chub and the bream. But when that's happening, I always feel the carp aren't too far behind, and it was the case uh, in point this morning, just as it started getting light. I uh, had a take, I was already dealing with a chub on another rod. This one was absolutely ripping, just there. Um, and yeah, I lost it. Uh, proper gutted. Um, the bites aren't easy to come by. Um, you know, a, a bite a night is exceptional. So yeah, somewhat disappointing after a great night, but that's fishing. It's a beautiful day, much nicer than yesterday morning. Let's see what happens. I'll get a I'll get a shot of him in a sec. Just literally, mate. Just, just stop talking for a sec. Gaze. It's, it's really stuck on something. It's great and bad. It's all that weed, bro. I think it's weed. Cool. Whew. Well, that absolutely <laughs> busted off. <laughs> oh. Snagged up down, there's obviously something on the bottom. Come on, bruv, come on, bruv, come on, bruv, come on, bruv. In you come. <laughs> come on, in you go, in you go, in you go, in you go. Yes, first river car. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> give nice me one. Give me a hug. <laughs> Oh, it? what a moment, mate. <laughs> he looks he's really black. black. He's black. He's a mirror as well, isn't he? Oh my God, it's a mirror. Oh, oh my, my God. God, look at that. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Buzzing. <laughs> moment, mate. That is everything I expected a river park <laughs> to look like. <laughs> what a bite as well. What a bite, what a, what a bite. Buzzing. Well bruv. No way, no awesome way, no bit. way. Unbelievable. Yeah. Absolutely buzzing. Unbelievable. <sighs> what a bite. Carnage. I need to take these waders off. I'm so hot. They're coming off. Oh, I can't stop smiling. Ladies, <clears throat> play yourselves. Mate. You're about to see me with less clothes on. There we go, look. How about that? Where was it? Here? Just down here, like, mate, we've been banging around. Yeah, literally just down there. Just down there. Oh. Your arms to the hen that feeds. You're dead wrong if you think. I can't wait to get this thing out. It's going to bite through bit me line. Makes it a little bit easier with transporting them. It's such a cool fish. Alan, it is actually black and red. It has black and red. It's a special one. <laughs> oh, 
Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, look at him. You know why he caught it, don't you? Because I appreciate him? No, oh, you what? picked that spider <laughs> up out of the canal. Because I got the spider? Yeah, oh, yeah. Man. So yesterday I threw a... Uh, Accidentally threw a spider in the, spider. the canal. I don't like spiders, so I threw him in. Felt bad, took him back out. <laughs> yeah. Holy yeah. shit, man. Yeah. That is That's incredible. Why. This is why I love fishing them out. It ain't a monster. Mate, that's incredible. That's one of the best carp I've caught for a long time. That really is. <laughs> Mate, look at it. Look at that belly. Them scales, yep. man. Snail. That's one. Look at that colour there. Mate, it's just... That there. <laughs> it's, you've got to get... Is that still rolling? Yeah. Yeah. No, I meant the other one, my camera. Yeah. I've got to get some steals of that belly, man. I don't normally take pictures of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Perfect little mouth. Some pretty special fishing moments this year, but I think it, this tops it. Mate, this I is I really like... do, man, for the actual buzz of something happening and... Look at him. Look at that cart. Right, let's get him uh, soaked again. Look at that for a fish. Like, I've, I've done a lot of fishing in my time. I'm not that old, but I've done a hell of a lot of fishing. And this, I can honestly say, is one of the best carp I've ever caught. I'm truly blown away. I really am. I've never fished the rivers really. I knew there was gems like this to be caught. But Al, honestly, mate, this, this is one of the best it's fish all out I've there ever for caught. The taking, guys. There's rivers right across the country with fish like this in them. You've just got to be focused, you know, get out there and go make it happen. Mate, he's amazing. Yeah. Like the colours, the, everything about this fish. A special cup. Mate, I'm so happy. Thank you so much, That's honestly. It's a pleasure, man. And like, yeah, I, I lost a fish earlier. I would have been despondent for probably at least two days and I forgot it. It's all in the past now and it's like, this is magical. Amazing. Absolutely magical. Amazing fish. Big ups, bro. Thank Good you, Good God. Yeah, very you. much. <laughs> this session with El's been proper good. It's been a long time coming, you know. I met him a good few years ago and we've never actually been out on a bank together. So I was buzzing in the lead up to it. He texted me the day before, I'm buzzing and yeah proper looking forward to it. We've come out and um, I've shown him a little bit about what I do, which is possibly a bit dissimilar to the sort of fishing he normally does. We were going places quickly, in and out, um, trying to find some fish, fish from a variety of different tactics and yeah, head on our way. And that's exactly what we've done. I honestly could not have hoped for more from this session. You know, I've had great fun bombing around with Alan. His style of fishing is really interesting, you know, and he absolutely loves it. The enthusiasm he has got, I haven't seen in anyone for a long time, you know. It bleeds into you and and uh, he's made it really good fun for me, let alone taking me to one of his favourite spots and enabling me to catch one of the finest carp I've ever caught. And at the very start, El was like, I'd love to catch my first river carp. So that was always kind of the underlining goal throughout. Um, yeah, he went and done it. It was a, a priceless moment and um, yeah, one I won't forget for a long time. An amazing carp, top session. I cannot wait to show people the photos. I've got my mate Dave, he loves the rivers. He's always told me to sort of come along with him and said how good they were. And I like fishing for big fish, you know, that is what I do. It's what I prefer to do. Um, but, you know, catching that fish, that means a lot to me. Um, and it's been a long time since I've caught a carp that has actually made me this excited. So yeah, eyes are well and truly opened and I will definitely be going back to the rivers.